डॉक्टर सामसुल आई एम स्टार्टिंग द रिकॉर्डिंग प्लीज स्टार्ट द रिकॉर्डिंग Yes, we are live. So, very good evening from Auto TV. Welcome to online education webinars. We would like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge and expertise. It's all, especially in such challenging times. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe days ahead, and we hope all these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on internet speed, which might be at times unstable. Please bear with us for any issues with internet. Today we have uh, Indian Orthopedic uh, Association's international webinars on digital radio alert joint pain. Thank you. Now I hand over to Manish Dawan sir to start the webinar. Manish, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and I welcome you all. to the digital radio ulnar joint and ulnar sided wrist pain a to z analysis webinar and uh, this is an initiative a combined initiative of indian orthopedic association i am dr manish dhawan and i'll be the moderator of this webinar i am i am based in delhi i am professor of orthopedics at gangaram institute of post graduate and medical sciences and uh, i am uh, i am also the treasurer of indian orthopedic association now first of all i welcome professor rc meena he is the president of indian orthopedic association he'll be joining shortly once he comes i will introduce him i also now introduce dr atul shrivastav he is the secretary of indian orthopedic association from agra so i welcome you sir dr atul dr atul shrivastav i welcome you and i let me introduce uh, uh actually he does not require uh, uh, any introduction dr pankaj general is convener with me and uh, he is the person who is uh, organized this whole event and he is so popular uh, nationally and internationally you can see that how many people uh, you know experts he has collected <laughs> all over the world so i welcome you sir i welcome our uh, indian orthopedic association the hand and wrist team and professor sudhir kumar Uh, is the chairman of hand and wrist team of indian orthopedic association and he is a very uh, highly reputed and noted surgeon from nachi welcome dr sudhir kumar uh, dr vikas gupta is a senior hand surgeon uh, he is based in uh, medanta in gurgaon uh, basically it's a sister part, part of uh, delhi so he is a, a noted hand surgeon at uh, medanta hospital Dr Ratan Damia is professor of orthopedics at uh, SMS Medical College Jaipur so he is member of hand and wrist uh, uh, session of IOA so i request uh, dr atul shrivastav dr atul dr atul is not there manish will go ahead ha uh, so dr pankaj uh, please just introduce the all the faculty please okay uh, we'll uh, introduce the faculty as we go by and each faculty comes on uh, with his presentation is that okay with you manish we'll save yeah yeah sure minutes. sure yeah, yeah okay. sure sure sir so we can start the first presentation and once uh, president and secretary comes we can introduce after the presentation okay so we can have the first presentation i welcome uh, all can you see my screen uh, ravi Yeah, yes, visible, sir. Yes. sir. Please go ahead. Go ahead, slide, guys. Okay, on, I welcome all. On the lower all side. The... On the lower left, sir. Yeah, please. Uncle, okay, sir, on the lower left. Yeah. Can you see the slide? Uh, uh, yeah, sir. Please put it in the slide mode. On the lower right. side. On yeah, the yeah. lower side. Yeah, expand it, sir. Now. Yeah, move, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. So we have faculty from uh, three continents, sir. Uh, they are in the fourth continent today, thanks to our technology, and they represent six countries, 
and they are all leading figures in hand surgery here. And uh, this is available to viewers from all the continents, and that too at no cost. With this, we start our talk on the ulnar sided wrist pain. It's an extremely common condition here. We have problems on the radial side. We have problem in the center of the wrist. We have problem on the ulnar side. And this five centimeters by three centimeters area creates a lot of problems. Almost 30 of them are enumerated here. And it's almost difficult to remember any of them. That's very tough. And equally tough is the fact that if you make a diagnosis, a patient has got wrist sprain, it is not acceptable. And nor is it acceptable to say, I'll give you a shot of steroid. That's extremely empirical in today's era. It's too vague and it's too generalized. And therefore, you have to have a systematic examination of the ulnar sided wrist pain. And what is meant by systematic? By systematic, I mean you have to follow a certain sequence. So to start with, what is the source of pain? The pain can come from bone. It can come from the joint. It can come from ligament. It can come from artery, nerve or a space occupying lesion or tumor there. So it's a systematic would be to start proximally and go distally. You start on the dorsal aspect and go volar word then. So what are the bony structure which can give rise to pain? It can be the ulnar styloid process. It can be triquetrum. As you go distally, hook of hamet. Further distally, it can be fifth metacarpal fracture here. Coming from the bones to the joint, it could be a distal radial ulnar joint which would be the main topic of discussion today in this webinar. Then it can be alnocarpal joint. That will be another extension of what we are going to talk now. It can be metacarpal joint. It can be carpometacarpal joint. Coming to the ligaments, it can be the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, TFCC. A big question which we are going to deal now. It can be lunar triquetral joint ligaments here, or it can be the tendons. It can be extensor carpal laris, flexor carpal laris here or it can be the nerve, ulnar nerve, or it can be the artery, any of them can give rise to problem on the ulnar side here. I mentioned 30 earlier, and I, I said that is difficult, and 10 are common of them. And again, this is difficult to remember. So how do you go? You go by following a five-story examination. This is what I learned from PC Ho in Hong Kong. And he said, if you follow this five-story concept, almost, 90% confidence you can make a general preliminary diagnosis of what's going on there. And you don't have to be stuck with a diagnosis of a sprained wrist because that is an unacceptable diagnosis here. So you begin from proximal and go distally on the back and then go on the front. Main palpable bony structures are on the dorsal surface of the wrist. And you can mentally project these bones onto the skin. So you have, you know what is distal radial nerve joint, you know lunate, do not triquetrum, hamet, and fifth metacarpal, and the joints and the intervening ligaments. And you know these structures, and you can mentally project them on the back. So, the five story concept will be you start on the proximal, the distal radial nerve joint, you go to the allocarpal joint, the third story will be the midcarpal joint, the fourth will be the intercarpal joint, and the fifth story will be the CMC joint. So, if you follow this sequence, on the back and then on the volar aspect, you are least likely to miss anything here. On the second floor is the alnocarpal joint. We are going to talk about, I'm not going to detail, but chronic TFCC tear in a cold patient, late presentation, alnocarpal impaction. Again, we are going to talk about these things here. I'm just enumerating to begin the discussion here. Then there's going to the third floor, it's intracarpal or midcarpal joint here. Fourth story is the intercarpal joint. The last top is the carpometacarpal joint. So if you follow this sequence, you are least likely to miss anything and you will clinch the diagnosis. Coming from going from the back, you go onto the front, you have a fracture of the pisiform here. You may palpate it and otherwise you may require uh, further imaging studies here. Taking a carpal tunnel view, you diagnose a fracture of hook of the hamet. So going from the dorsal, you come on the volar aspect here. On the volar aspect, you have problems related to ulna nerve here as it winds around the hook of the hamet here. So you have a ulna nerve entrapment in this area here. Or you can have a tumor here, like in this patient who presented with a ulna nerve deficit because the ulna nerve was getting compressed because of this tumor here. So coming in the fag end of this talk here, if you have this kind of arrangement 
it's extremely confusing you will not understand here it's all jumbled up so you have to follow a sequence if you follow a sequence that is five story ground floor distal radial nerve joint ulno carpal joint mid carpal joint intercarpal joint cmc joint and structures in these structures from the back and on the volar aspect if you follow this sequence it's least likely that you'll miss something to start with it might take some time but as you proceed in this order you will not miss and you will be able to come to a reasonable working diagnosis and your first examination i thank you very much and any question i think we'll take the questions in the end is it okay with you so now may i invite professor steven moran to share his presentation uh professor moran can you load your presentation i think you are speaking on anatomy of uh, druj uh, professor steven moran is from mayo clinic is a professor of orthopedics uh n number of publications uh, are coming from mayo clinic and he is a uh, one of the flag bearers who is been speaking uh, one of the talks on distal radial nerve joint has been uh, uh, adams berger procedure and long term study has uh, come out with dr moran uh, being one of the uh, authors there so here i am with professor steven moran and he's going to talk to us about anatomy and biomechanics and examination of distal radial nerve joint professor moran Over thank you. you thank you professor jindal and uh for all of the participants i think that was a beautiful introduction we're going to really focus on the first and the second floor uh based on uh, dr jindal's model which i think is is excellent so the distal radial nerve joint developed evolutionarily as we uh, uh matured into uh, primates and we had the requirement for brachiation which means you know the process of moving through the trees which required a mobile forearm different than the quadrupeds now that we're uh, we were moving through the trees and as that developed what happened was there was a recession of the ulna uh, from the carpus and and we developed the ulnar carpal meniscus and eventually the development of the distal radial nerve joint and because of that you will find in every patient that you examine a fair amount of variation in the length of the ulna, the position and the thickness of the ulnar carpal ligaments and the bony shape of the carpus. And I think that's all important uh, when you're examining your patients. The distal radial ulnar joint is part of the overall forearm joint and it's only one fourth of, of that joint. You have to remember that there are other components in the forearm, primarily the interosseous membrane, the annular ligament and the proximal radial ulnar joint. So as uh, Professor Jindal was saying, you always have to start pro proximal and work distal. There may well be a previous history of an Essex Loprestia injury or something like that that is giving you instability at the wrist, producing ulnar-sided wrist pain that is uh, coming from the elbow. The kinematics of this joint is uh, a stable ulnar post and the radius rotates around it. So the ulna is the fixed bone within the forearm joint. The osseous anatomy, as you're all aware of, consists of the sigmoid notch, the ulnar seat, and then the ulnar pole on the top. And then between, or at the uh, most ulnar aspect of that seat, is this concavity, which we call the fovea. And it's within the fovea, where these arrows are, that we have attachments of the very important part of the radial and palmar uh, ulnar carpal ligaments, which will help to stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint. The radius of curvature of the ulna is less than that of the sigmoid notch. So that means that this is a sloppy joint. So we not only have rotation of the radius around the ulna, but there's also the ability for translation. So even in a patient with a stable distal radial ulnar joint, when we examine the wrist, and as, we'll, as I'll show you, when you shuck the ulna and the radius, there, will, there should be some motion in most patients. It's if it's different between one side and the other, or if that instability in terms of palmar and dorsal translation produces pain. Because the, there's a difference in the size of the joints, this uh, configuration has variable stability in each patient. There's maximal joint surface contract when the patient's in neutral, and that's about 60% uh, 
of the uh, seat is in contact with the sigmoid notch. But when we move into the extremes of supination or pronation, there's only about 10% of the joint that's actually in contact. So because of that, there's an extensive network of ligaments that need to stabilize this joint. There's also variability in the shape of the sigmoid notch. The percentage of patients will have a very hypoplastic or flat sigmoid notch, while others will have a ski slope or C, C shape or S shape. And this was described by John Stanley and, and Talat uh, several years ago. You would imagine that patients that have a flat face sigmoid notch may be more susceptible to injuries or instability of the distal radial knee joint. So the bony configuration of the sigmoid notch provides only 30% of joint stability. So as you move from pronation to supination, the primary stabilizer is going to be the ligaments and muscles of the carpus. And the primary stabilizers can basically broken, be broken down to these five structures, the TFCC, the ulnar carpal ligaments, the ECU subsheath, the pronator, and the inner osseous membrane. This is a drawing by one of my mentors, Dick Berger, who spent the majority of his life studying the DRUJ. And he, uh, and these five structures can be encompassed within the triangular fibrocartilage complex made up of the TFCC, the ECU subsheath, the ulnar carpal ligaments, and then the dorsal and radial palmar ligaments. Beginning with the TFCC, this structure really plays two roles. It's a very commonly injured and perforated. The central portion of the disc is primarily a, a load sharing mechanism between the ulnar aspect of the carpus and the ulna. It's basically a shock absorber. But the peripheral part of the disc, as you see here, which is invested with all these nerve fibers as well as the vasculature of the TFCC, is incorporated into the palmar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. And, and that is the stabilizing component of the TFCC itself. The TFCC attaches to the ulnar head both peripherally through these peripheral attachments that surround the ulnar styloid and also these deep fibers that we just spoke about that attach to the fovea. And that's why when you're looking at x-rays and you see a very proximally placed ulnar styloid fracture, it's not always 100% predictive of distal ulnar joint instability, but it should raise a marker in your mind that this is a warning sign that the patient may have post-traumatic DRUJ instability. The most important stabilizers based upon biomechanical studies that I'll show you in a minute are the dorsal and the palmar radial ulnar ligaments. These, as I just mentioned, have deep fibers here that you can see attached to the fovea and then these peripheral uh, portions of the ligament, which will then wrap around the style and essentially attach to the, to the outer capsule. That's important to remember when you're repairing the TFCC, and we will talk briefly, I will just touch on arthroscopic repair, which Jeff will, will focus on. But if you're repairing it openly, and I think for purposes of understanding the anatomy, open repair uh, for, for this talk is what I'll primarily focus on. You have to remember that if you're repairing the TFCC, you not only need to repair the periphery here, but you also need to repair it back to the bone itself. And this can either be done through suture tunnels or with the use of suture anchors. So that by and large is the most important component of stability to the DRUJ. And it's where you're gonna be focusing most of your surgical treatment. The other areas that contribute, just like in the scapholunate ligament, the secondary stabilizers are the ulnar carpal ligaments, the ECU subsheath and the pronator. The only carpal ligaments are palmar structures. So if patients injure these, they're gonna have pain usually in the ulnar snuff box and towards the FCU. And I'll show you how to examine for that. The important ligaments are the ulnar lunate, the ulnar triquetral, and the ulnar capitate ligaments. And again, these all originate from the volar rim of the TFCC and then pass onto the carpus. The ECU also originates from the dorsal radial ulnar ligament on the, on the dorsal side of the wrist and its subsheath that you can see here contributes substantially to the stability of the dorsal portion of the DRUJ capsule. Then we have the pronator, which has two heads. The deep head, as I've shown here, is important for stabilizing in terms of rotation. So these three secondary stabilizers are often injured in significant dislocations or in fractures and trauma. 
And I think they're important to think about because they can be sources of residual pain, whether it's an ECU subluxation postoperatively, a split tear of the ulnar tricuspid ligament that we'll discuss in a minute, or injuries to the to the uh, muscular sheath of the pronator. The other component that I haven't mentioned and I'm leaving for last is the interosseous membrane. The distal oblique bundle has uh, gained a lot of attention recently as serving as an important secondary stabilizer in preventing translation of the ulna against the radius. This is just a picture of the uh, distal oblique bundle of the interosseous membrane as the patient moves from neutral to pronation and supination here. And it has been found by Dr. Rizzo, one of our partners, to be an important secondary stabilizer of the DRUJ. And in fact, during a shortening procedure, it's this ligament that is tightened. And it's thought that that's why ulnar shortening procedures help to stabilize patients with this amount of variation in the interosseous membrane. And not every patient has a stout uh, dorsal interosseous uh, oblique ligament. So this is, uh, it's difficult to tell. You can certainly look with MRI but not every patient will have this ligament playing an important component in the stability of their distorsional joint. So essentially you have this multi-slinged structure that surrounds the ulnar head that provides stability during rotation. I think in looking at this image, I, what I wanna emphasize to you is that the ulnar head is incredibly important. If you take that ulnar head out, whether you're doing a DARA procedure or a HIT procedure, Bowers procedure, where you're removing a portion of the ulnar head, you're collapsing that stability and all those ligaments will become lax. So in the US, it's, it, it has been um, popular for the past several years to try to replace this, whether it's a hemiarthroplasty or a total joint arthroplasty, uh, but it's difficult to restore the native anatomic uh, stability of that joint if you're going to remove the ulnar head. There have been several studies performed by Schund and Eckenstam and Hoggart uh, looking at the, the most, what is the most important structure of the distoradial ulnar joint. And these studies are, are confusing because they're contradictory, but if looked at in a whole, I think that all of them point to the importance of the dorsal and the proximal portion of the radial ulnar ligament. Uh, this uh, study by Stewart in 2000 tried to elucidate which were the most important components in terms of dorsal or palmar dislocation. I think one of the uh, best images that I can provide was actually drawn by Bill Kleinman from the Indiana Hand Center. And when the joint goes into pronation, there is tightening and loosening of different components of the dorsal and the palmar radial and the ligament. So in pronation, the external fibers of the uh, dorsal radial ulnar ligament are taut while the palmar structures are loose and, and, and complementary in the volar ligaments. So these deeper fibers tend to be taut while the external fibers are laxed and, and vice versa in terms of rotation. Thus, when we're reconstructing this joint, and I think Mark and, and I will both uh, discuss uh, ligament techniques to reconstruct, it's very difficult to, uh, to produce something with a tendon or with a uh, uh, ligament weave that can reproduce this uh, very uh, elaborate system of uh, tightening and loosening of the same ligament. I think the important thing for us all to remember, since the TFCC disruption is the most common injury that you'll see post-traumatically, is just to repair not only the periphery of the capsule, but also the foveal attachment. And here we're using suture anchors drilled directly through the fovea, but a, uh, our, our, uh, any type of anchoring device can work. Outside of stability, the major component of the TFCC is to share load across the carpus. So we're gonna change gears here just a little bit and talk now about an impaction. So the 20% of the load of the carpus passes through the ulna and this is cushioned by the TFCC. Things that can increase load over the ulnar aspect of the wrist are ulnar deviation, patients that have a significant positive ulnar variance and pronation. This is a, another slide from Tolot, just showing a beautiful slide, showing the patients that tend to be ulnar negative have thicker TFCCs or thicker cushion, My patients that are more ulnar neutral or ulnar positive will have a much thinner TFCC. So the thickness is directly correlated to the ulnar variance. So you can imagine if you have a thinner TFCC, it doesn't take 
long in your lifespan to end up perforating this portion of the TFCC. And that certainly can be exacerbated in patients that have activities that require repetitive amounts of pronation. When you move from pronation into supination, there is a actual a shortening, if you will, of the ulna in relation to the radius. It, it, it's a, in dynamically, what is happening is because the radius is rotating around the ulna, the ulna is not moving, the radius becomes shorter in relation to the ulna and that ulna can be more prominent and push into the ulnar aspect of the carcass. So in the third decade of life, we expect most patients uh, to have a, a fewer percentage of TFCC injuries. And as you reach your sixth decade, better than half the patients arthroscopically will have some type of perforation uh, due, due to attrition of the TFCC. So again, ulnar perforations have been linked to ulnar, or TFCC perforations have been linked to ulnar variants. And patients that are ulnar positive or neutral can have 73% uh, perforations as in a study by Palmer. When you're looking at perforations, and primarily we're doing this arthroscopically, the longer the patient has a perforation and ulnar impaction, the greater the risk of them moving on to carpal instability or to frank arthritis. Things that you wanna be looking for are simply wear of the cartilage. And then as the patient has per, uh, impaction that lasts longer, they can go on to develop chondromalacia and eventual LT instability. And this is just uh, three different examples of the lunate in patients that have had longstanding impaction. You can see the fibrillation. And then here, the eventual wear and loss of cartilage completely over the lunate. In terms of treating this, we usually just shorten the ulna. Uh, and I think that there has been some discussion in, in the hand surgical community about what can then happen uh, to the disarray ulnar joint. You should be aware that there are different shapes to the DRUJ. Some are quite vertical, some are sloped. And there's been some concern that shortening a patient with an unfavorable appearance of the distal radial nerve joint could cause problems. How we, however, we have not seen that uh, clinically. So now I'll just take the last five minutes and quickly move on to examination. I'm, again, I'm not gonna focus on the entire five tiers as, as presented before, but just really looking at the bottom floor and the second floor. So we're really gonna be focusing on just the DRUJ. And these patients will come in and they can point on their wrist where their pain is. And it's coming usually over the ulnar head or over the triquetrum. The examination that I usually begin with is just examining range of motion, make sure there's no problems at the elbow. But then when you compress across the distal radial ulnar joint, the ulna into the radius, patients who have pain with that maneuver often have early evidence of DRUJ arthritis. Patients may also have gross instability in the office, which is the piano key sign that we'll look at in a second. And the press test is another very valuable test to, uh, I think, examine or, or screen out patients that have TFCC injuries. The press test is essentially asking the patient to rise from the chair uh, using their wrists. So they're pushing down and lifting up. And if the patient has pain, if you think about that motion, you're, you're really loading the ulnar aspect of your wrist. Uh, that, that is a tip off as well that the patient may have some impaction or potentially a central perforation of the TFCC. Foveal tenderness, we'll examine in a second, and then any gross clicking or instability uh, as you manipulate the DRUJ is always a tip off that there's probably an injury to the periphery of the TFCC. This is the piano key sign, and here we're performing it in the operating room, but that is just, and, and this is re really important, you just stabilize, you bring the elbow into 90 degrees of flexion, you stabilize the radius, with your thumb and the remaining fingers. And then you just manipulate or try to shuck the ulna back and forth. In a gross piano key sign, it will clunk. And here you're seeing it clunk volarly. It creates a, a, a soft tissue depression. The ulnar head is present here and it's missing here. And then it will reduce back. If I have any questions, I will use a diagnostic injection into the mid-carpal joint if I'm concerned about LT injuries as you see here or into the distal radial ulnar joint and ask the patient to then perform uh, grip strength measurements before and after the injection to evaluate if there's an improvement, then I suspect that there's pathology there. 
obviously you're going to compare this and the next talk is going to be all about MRI and radiographs, but things, this gross instability, if you're looking at this in the x-ray, you can see this is a Palmer dislocation of the ulna, widening, uh, dislocation on the, rat, on the lateral view or greater than five millimeters of radial shortening have all been linked historically by more with problems with DRUJ. So the other thing to just not forget is gross mechanical issues. You always want to get a forearm film and I always compare these to the other side. So not only wrist films, but forearm films as well. And obviously you have to have parallel bone structure to have to have the, the mechanics of the forearm work. This is just a child with OI. There's no way this child's gonna be able to rotate their forearm. There's no problem with the distal radial ulnar joint and with corrective osteotomies, you can restore this patient to full motion. So if I've ruled out gross mechanical issues, I know there's not a fracture at the elbow or the forearm, then I break down the patient's complaints into three categories, pain alone, pain with instability, and pain with arthritis. That's how I think about every, all the pathology in the DRUJ. Pain alone is a very special subset of problems. You're either going to be dealing with a central TFCC tear, early impaction, a split tear of some of those extrinsic ligaments, particularly the UT ligament, a tear of the uh, lunar trapezoid ligament, or synovitis, which we would see in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. When you're examining for this uh, ulnar triquetral tears or tears of the uh, ulnar carpal ligaments, we're gonna be examining the fovea. This is also very sensitive for picking up peripheral TFCC injuries. And you can all find the, this foveal sign by just putting your finger on your FCU and just dropping dorsal and pushing up toward the carpus or distal. And you can feel that space right underneath the uh, ulnar styloid. And this is the attachment of the volar ulnar carpal ligaments. And if the patient has pain with this maneuver, uh, that is fairly uh, sensitive for picking up an ulnar triquetral tear or a tear of the TF, peripheral tear of the TFCC. This is just a radiograph showing that maneuver being performed actually by Dr. Berger. Tears of the ulnar uh, carpal ligaments are thought to be due to uh, repetitive um, rotation in causing a rent to develop in these extrinsic ligaments, which then cannot uh, be repaired. It's, it's essentially a nutritional problem. This is really becomes very evident when you look at this through the arthroscope. This is that vertical rent, and, and Jeff uh, will be discussing arthroscopy in more detail, utilizing tear, but does benefit from debridement, a synovectomy, and attempts at closing down that vertical repair. And Dr. Berger has written several papers on this. Ulnar impaction can be uh, differentiated from uh, these other injuries by uh, the ulnar carpal impaction test, where the patient's ulna is held down while the wrist is deviated ulnarly and the forearm supinated. This tends to produce a fair bit of localized uh, pain over the ulnar head. The other way to do this is to simply have the patient bring their hand into full pronation and then deviate the wrist. And they usually tell you, yes, that is exactly the pain that I'm feeling. And obviously you correlate that with your MRI and your regular plain films to make the diagnosis of impaction. These are just some examples. And again, Jeff will be going over all of this, but this is just, in, the diagnosis is, is verified. This is certainly the gold standard. You can see the tear within the TFCC. The, in this patient, the beginnings of the chondromalacia above in the triquetrum. So the next category would be DRUJ injuries with pain and instability. And these 90% of these are gonna be tears of the periphery of the TFCC and injuries to the palmar or dorsal radial ulnar ligaments. However, it can also be a tear of the joint capsule, or it can be a tear of the EC sudden stability. That's always one of the questions. I think here's your surgery. You can see the, just in the office, we can get subluxation of the ulnar head. But many of these patients are big, and you know they have a lot of secondary stabilizers and muscles that you can't overcome in the office. And so the benefits of taking these patients to the operating room and examining them under anesthesia, and here you can see this is just gross multidirectional instability of the DRUJ. That's really, for me, the gold standard. If you see this, there's clicking and crunching, you know you have to reconstruct. You, you have to remember that 
instability is usually due to some unseen bony problem. Now, these are all gross examples of uh, DREJ injuries, but be very careful. And I, again, I emphasize getting comparative forearm views. Many patients have had a previous distal radius fracture that was not treated. There's a slight malunion and, or there's been a fracture of the ulnar styloid and that can contribute to uh, gross instability with pain. These are just some, again, some gross examples that you may see overlapping volar dislocation uh, and on the axial views on the CT or the MRI showing instability. We may have to, in some cases, uh, push the patient to get an abnormal view. What we have is a special gantry that we've created where we can actually have the patients get a dynamic uh, CT scan so that we can uh, load the joint, essentially, similarly to what you'd be doing in the operating room. And you can see that in resisted pronation in this patient, we see that there is instability at the DRUJ. When you're going to be examining these, again, peripheral tears here or dis, uh, dissociation of the TFCC from the fovea, these are the most common causes of, of pain and instability. Uh, rarely can you see cases here where you have simply attenuation of the TFCC in a patient that has recurrent synovitis. This would be the most common situation, but also in patients that may have had a peripheral tear that have gone untreated for several years, and, and Mark and I will discuss this later. So again, I really think the gold standard now for many of these has been the development of arthroscopy, and Jeff is going to discuss that. And for those of you that don't do a lot of arthroscopy, I, I, this is just to show you what a normal TFCC looks like and then what an injured TFCC looks like. And it's, it's not, even for a beginning arthroscopist, it's not hard to make the distinction. The final category is pain with arthritis. And again, this is going to be made based on the plane radiograph. And I think that the way I break these down is stable and unstable. And in a stable patient with arthritis, the options are unconstrained uh, DRUJ implants. In a patient with unstable arthritis, I have to use a constrained arthroplasty. Other options so certainly would be a DARA procedure, suavic apology procedure, and a variety of different things that we're going to discuss in just a little bit. So the last point that I'll make is yeah, I have my three categories. The things you always want to rule out are things that can go along with all of them. Uh, concomitant carpal pathology, ECU tendonitis, ECU subluxation, FCU tendonitis and piezotriquetral arthritis, all things that can develop as we get older, and you want to rule those out additionally with your physical exam. So in the last uh, two minutes, I just want to quickly go over two cases that help to uh, elucidate all the points that we've just brought up. This was a young man that was sent to me in my office with a six-month history of wrist pain. The uh, doctor was made the diagnosis of box disease and wanted to shorten his radius, an older, uh, radial shortening procedure. His mother was uh, concerned about that and brought the patient to see me. He had had a history as a short order cook, and so he was performing a lot of pronation and supination. You can see that he's roughly ulnar neutral. When we go ahead and get his uh, MRI, we see that there is indeed some edema of the lunate, but that edema is primarily localized over the ulnar aspect of his carpus. And when we perform a physical exam on this patient, when we bring him into pronation and ulnar deviation, he tells me that it's exactly the pain that he gets during the day when he's working. So we're, not, we're concerned now, not that this is Keenbox disease, but instead the diagnosis of much more common ulnar carpal impaction in a patient that's ulnar neutral. So as this patient is repetitively pronating with his work, he's creating dynamic impaction. And indeed, when we scope this patient's wrist, this is the radial carpal joint, we have a confirmation of the diagnosis as we move ulnarly. As you see here, we're going from radial now to the ulnar aspect of the wrist, you can see the chondromalacia developing over the lunate. And then here's the trequitra, and we have a huge hole in the TFCC, a perforation that we can actually drop the camera into making the diagnosis for us. And this patient's in impaction has gone on for such a long time that they have evidence of early monotrequitral instability. So this patient was treated with an ulnar shortening instead of a radial shortening, which would have made the diagnosis even worse. Again, you're gonna hear about the, the use of MRI and CT scans, but again, I think that in, when you're differentiating between impaction and Keenbox disease, and we're not gonna to touch upon this much today, you usually see global changes in the lunate as opposed to impaction where your edema is really confined to the ulnar aspect 
of the lunate itself. Here's just some examples of Keen box disease with fracture and global changes throughout the lunate. The case of the last case is a 14 year old young girl who sent to me. She said she was a gymnast. She does a lot of tumbling and she had wrist pain for two years. Uh, the doctors all thought this was secondary to a TFCC injury. It was on the ulnar aspect of her wrist. And as you can see, her, her x-rays look pretty good. She doesn't have any evidence of uh, ulnar impaction here. Uh, the, I think this is the one area that, that I also have made several uh, mistakes in my examination in not moving to the second floor, as Dr. Jindal was saying, of my exam. Uh, palpation directly over the lunate and the triquetrum can pick up the very rare cases of lunotriquetral instability. And to differentiate TFCC injuries from lunotriquetral instabilities, I rely on uh, three different tests. One is the LT compression test, where I'm simply moving above the ulnar styloid and pushing against the triquetrum into the lunate. And in this woman, this produced extreme pain. She did not have pain when I examined the, her ulnar fovea, but she did have pain with the LT compression test. An additional test is the climate exam when you sh use the pisiform to shuck the triquetrum against the lunate, again, causing pain in this young woman. And finally, this uh, Linscheid LT shuck test, which is performed from the dorsum. Another very valuable test that you can use to differentiate TFCC pathology from LT pathology or carpal pathology pathology on the ulnar aspect of the wrist is this derby Just relocation now, test. Now. Yep. And so with the derby relocation test, you can actually stabilize the uh, lunotrichotral relationship by placing the wrist into extension and measuring a difference in grip strength between the relocation, once the joint is relocated and when it's not. And that can also help you make the diagnosis. Finally, arthroscopy is very valuable. One physical finding you can look for in these patients with bad LT injuries is the evidence of a carpal sag or a bayonet sign. That's essentially the ulnar aspect of the carpus falling off of the ulna. And these patients can be treated with, I don't think we're gonna discuss this today, but tenodesis procedures to help restore the stability of the LT joint. Yeah, all right, so I just, uh, last slide, I think the most common cause with pain with instability, which is what you're going to be seeing, is not a wrist sprain, but it's an injury to the uh, palmar or radial ulnar components of the, of the DRUJ, and treatment is always initially to fix the bony problems and then repair the ligament. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pankaj? Yes. Manish, yeah, can, it, Manish. Yeah, can it take a minute? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, please, Manish. Yeah. Uh, Doctor R C Meena, Meena sir. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh -huh. sir. Doctor R C Meena is there. He is president of Indian Orthopedic Association and uh, senior professor at uh, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. Doctor R C Meena, uh, we have this. You have started this webinar because you are doing COVID duties. So I thank you for taking out time and coming and addressing it. Uh, please uh, give few words to this webinar. Yes, sir. Yes, Hello. yes, yes, we can hear you, sir. Yes. So, on the behalf of IOA, I welcome all of the delegates across the country and globe. And the organizer of this webinar really has done a wonderful job. I assure that this webinar will be great, successful, and definitely benefit the experts and the specialists who believe in the hand surgery and the distal radiola joint is a very common problem nowadays in the trauma <clears throat> majority of cases found because of the problem associated around the radiola joint particularly distal so i am looking forward that the grand success and great success of this webinar will definitely benefit the listeners and viewer of this webinar all the best and I am with you. Keep it thank this end of the webinar forever. Thank you. thank you, Meena sir. Thank you. Very thank obliged you with Dr. kind sir, words. Manish. Thank you, Pankaj. Thank yeah. you. And our secretary, Atul, as well, and all valued foreign delegates. Thank you, thank Meena you, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank Dr. You. Atul Srivastava is already secretary of Indian Orthopedic Association. I request Dr. Atul Srivastava to speak few words. Well, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to this Indo-International Webinar on Rouge Injuries, which is being organized by the hand section of the Indian Orthopedic Association. 
and due to the valiant efforts of our very own Dr. Pankaj Jindal, uh, I welcome all the esteemed foreign faculty to this webinar. And we from our side present to you three rock stars in hand surgery from India, Dr. Sudhir Kumar, who's the chairman of the head section, Dr. Pankaj Jindal, and Dr. Vikas Gupta. Wish you a very happy and fruitful learning and thank you for joining in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atul. Uh, sorry for interruption and uh, over to pa Dr. Pankaj Jindal to, for, to continue the webinar. Dr. Pankaj Jindal, please. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Manji. Okay, over to Stephen. Uh, uh, you want to, any faculty want to add something to what uh, Professor Stephen Moran has uh, said? Jeff, you want to add something? No. Okay. Your talk is going to come. So with no question, I move on to the next talk and that's from uh, Jeff Ecker. He's a president of Australian Hand Society, and I welcome Professor Jeff Ecker. Uh, he is going to talk to us about MRI and the role of arthros, which is extremely important because what we see usually patient gets a pain in the wrist. He first goes to an MRI center before he comes to the orthopedic surgeon, and he said, "Doctor, here's the report." I said, "What happened?" I said, "I have a pain in the wrist." No, that's not the approach. Let's have Professor Jeff Ecker. He's going to talk to us about. MRI and Scopy. Professor. Sir, so you have to unmute yourself. Jeff, please unmute yourself. Jeff, you have to unmute yourself. Jeff, you have to unmute. The organizer has muted me. Hi. <laughs> Are we okay now? Yes, okay. Okay. Oh, good. I was, all, I was muted by the organizer. Somebody very sensible. Uh, look, thank you very much for organizing this and asking me, uh, Pankash and the committee and the panel. And it's really good to share time with everybody here in these difficult times. So I was asked to talk about MRI and specifically the hook test. <clears throat> and that's what I've restricted my talk to. Um, well, oh. um, so the MRI scan and arthroscopy, uh, they need context. The MRI and arthroscopy by themselves, they're confusing. We need the history, the symptoms, the examination, functional x-rays, uh, variance views, plus or minus a CT scan, and you need to put them all together. <clears throat> to make sense of this. And today we're going to be focusing on the um, role of the MRI scan and comparing it to the results for dry arthroscopy. Now, dry arthroscopy is something that uh, Paco taught us in the radiocarpal joint, in the midcarpal joint. And we just extended that into the distal radial on the joint. And it really is an excellent technique in the distal radial on the joint. So here's a girl with ulnar sided mechanical wrist pain. She's got a positive allotment, it hurts. She's stable on the other side. And if I do that, she's got a marked apprehension test. Now that's DRUJ pathology, providing everything else is negative. And as Pankash told us, there's up to 30 things that can cause trouble in the ulnar side of the wrist. So you've really got to get those out of the story. But if they're all excluded, this is just a radio ulnar joint pathology. So in 12 months, we looked at patients who had a positive Weindock test. We had 47. And what do we find with dry arthroscopy? 86% had a TFCC tear and 14% had other pathology. And that comprised things like scapulinar instability, ECU pathology, and ST from Ranshoulders on a carpal impaction. So <clears throat> if we do a Weindock test, we've got an 80% accuracy for a triangular fibrocartilage tear, providing everything else is negative. How does the MRI fare? Well, we looked at 65 cases, a retrospective study, and we diagnosed a TFC SLI <laughs> instability tear in 31, an isolated triangular fibrocartilage tear in 22, and an isolated scapholinar instability in eight. <laughs> So what do we do with the MRI? Well, we detected two combined TFCC SLI tears, 10 isolated TFC tears, 16, we only got part of the story. 
13, we missed it completely. 12, we missed it completely in the isolated TFC seat tear. And we, and we didn't detect eight scathing and eight possibilities. I hope that's not crossing. I'm hearing some extra noise there. So that's a little bit complex. So how do we simplify that? Well, 18% were accurate on an MRI, 24% partially accurate, 51% inaccurate, and 7% false positive. So you need to know what you're looking for. Now, if you dissect a triangular fibre cartilage in the ulnar side of the wrist joint, you'll see the triangular fibre cartilage is one solid structure that goes into the triquetrum, then the lunate, and then comes across dorsally and links in with the entire soft tissue envelope. You need to exclude other pathology and the MRI is very, very good for that. And you need to understand that there are many things that are beyond the resolution of the MRI scan. So in most cases, it does help with the anatomy. Um, it, it doesn't define the anatomy, nor does it give you a clue about what type of repair you need to do. So getting back to it, our wind-off test is 86% accurate. This is quite of interesting where the examination and the history are very accurate, more accurate than an isolated MRI scan out of context. 42% accurate with an MRI. So what happens with the arthroscopic hook test? And I was asked to address this because this is one of the tests we use to work out what's going on with the triangular fibre cartilage, particularly the foveal insertion. And here we have a positive hook test. There's no doubt there's a hook under the triangular fibre cartilage. I can lift it up and it's impacting on the bottom of the lunate. So if I had distal radial on the joint instability in my past life, if I had distal radial on the joint instability, a painful apprehension test, plus or minus a positive MRI, and a positive hook test at arthroscopy, I would say that patient needed a foveal repair. But what happens when you look into the DRUJ? You can see me debriding the DRUJ from the radiocarpal joint. And you can see this dorsal distal peripheral tear. You can see the site of the four, five or six R portal. And it's really important. The main structural damage is dorsal when you start looking at it through the scope. But then you look inside the DAUJ, you've got to clean it out, debride it. And then you can see the foveal insertion, but it's not just good enough to see it. You have to feel it to be certain that it's intact. So all of a sudden we can see the foveal insertion and the ligament that goes into it. So we looked at people that had, had a positive hook test, we looked at 45, 87% had an intact foveal insertion. Initially, when I saw this, I said to myself, they're attenuated, they're stretched, but there's too many of them. So the question is how can you have a positive hook test with an intact foveal insertion. How does this happen? This is a dissection on a cadaver and you can make anything happen in a cadaver, but you can see if you divide it dorsally, you can see you can get a positive hook test with an intact foveal insertion. And if you look here, the triangular fibre cart, this is on the right and I'm coming in through uh, four, five or six R, and you can see looking down between this deep peripheral tear right into the foveal insertion. It's amazing what you can see using dry arthroscopy and a 1.9 millimeter scope. So how does this happen? This is what we think happens. You get a dorsal distal tear and with increasing severity it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and eventually takes out the foveal insertion. So with dry arthroscopy, you can always see and feel the triangular fiber cartilage, but this isn't reported the foveal insertion. You can always see the foveal insertion but this isn't reported in the literature. The literature states that you can see it in 50 to 60% of cases. When I travel around the world to these arthroscopy courses, many of the people that are starting arthroscopy find arthroscopy of the DAUJ difficult. It has a learning curve. So what we're going to do now is spend some time showing you how I dry scope the DAUJ. So you have a three, four, four, and insert the forceps 
In this mm -hmm. case, this is a 4.5 portal. You can see the TFCC is lax. There's a hook test. There's no doubt about that. If you debride it, you can see the defect is actually dorsal. The, the tear is predominantly dorsal. Put a needle into the DRUJ and feel the ulnar head immediately below the TFCC. Then put in forceps, feel the ulnar head. You can lift it up and see the ghost sign. It's really important to feel the ulnar head and you don't put it into the substance of the TFCC. Here's a great trick. Use two obturators. When you pass the 1.9 scope into the second obturator, make sure the scope is looking at 90 degrees towards the ulnar styloid and your camera is directly upright. And then it's microsurgery. You have to pull back ever so slightly, millimeter at a time. At times it can be very unclear and difficult. So insert a needle into the Vola DRUJ portal and then clean it out and debride. And here you can see the foveal insertion. It's a little bit red, it's not quite right, but here's the trick, swap your view because you can get caught out. You can see something that looks all right on one view, but when you flick it the other way, the foveal insertion is gone. So here I've done is I've changed the scope into the Vola DRUJ portal and I'm probing through the 6R or 3-4 portal. And you can see there's a peripheral tear that you can see up into the dorsum of the TFCC. Now, when I used to use the 4-5 portal, I'd occasionally get into trouble with the extensive Digitime Minimi. I stick an ultrasound on it in the office and I pick it up occasionally. And in this case, I had problems. It kept getting in the road, so I exteriorized it. Now this is Toshi Nakamura, upstairs, downstairs. In this view, you can see you're below the TFCC and above it. A small curve to the needle makes it easy. You go underneath the TFC and simply penetrate it in the right location. Here's a little twist trick that I learned from somebody at a meeting. You pull it out, you've got lots of suture in there, makes it very easy to pull it out. And this is real time, the, the repair is very quick. And then a straight needle through the dorsal part because you want to repair the dorsal part. Pull it out. And then you thread a double strand of 2O vicor through. So it makes a really good suture. Now, if you pull down on it, look at that. It approximates the foveal insertion, but you can still see a gap. So I didn't like that very much. So I used a suture that I learned from Parco, the all inside suture and I just augmented it with an all inside suture the way I learned from Parker. Now that's, I don't need that very often, but it's a really good trick to have up your sleeve. And you can see when you pull down on one and the other, it actually approximates. So you don't need any fancy for this. You can cut it with a pair of iris scissors. That's a suture separator from the shoulder set. And if they're stable, when you move them, you don't have to splint them above elbow. So here's another one. This is somebody who had a central defect in the triangular fibre cartilage. And you can see the needles passing through very easily this way. These are very good ones to start with if you haven't done it. So I'm looking through the 3-4 portal. And right now I'm working through the 6-R portal. So in the past 12 months, I swapped from the 4.5 and gone exclusively to the 6R, and I haven't had any problems with the occasional pickup of the extensive digitorum, digitime minimi, because that actually crosses distally and ulnally. So when you're examining a wrist, you should be able to examine it the same way in your clinic in one and a half minutes every time. The same applies to the radiocarpal and midcarpal joint. If you're organized, you can get through it in one and a half to two minutes if you're doing enough of them. And the importance of that is you have a set method and you look at everything. So you get the really good idea about what's normal and what's abnormal. And you've got all the data before it so you can put it in context. It takes five to 10 minutes to scope a DRUJ because sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes there's lots of soft tissue in there and you have to debride it. And it takes a while to learn how to do that. But once you develop the technique, it's straightforward. It takes three to five minutes to do a peripheral repair of the triangular fibre cartilage. It takes me about an hour to do a transosseous foveal tendon graft. You just pass a piece of palmaris longus uh, through the triangular fibre cartilage 
and through a transosseous tunnel. And this is what it looks like. There's a positive hook test. You can often see the ECU or the extensor digitime minimi in these severe tears. There's a bare ulnar styloid. And I'm using a guide that Toshi's manufactured. Uh, there's an ophthalmic knife through the triangular fibre cartilage and just pulling in a palmaris longus through that and down through a transosseous tunnel. And in addition to this, a peripheral repair. I was going to show this, but we simply didn't have enough time. But I found this to be a very useful technique and it's anatomically specific. So we've talked about the diagnosis, history, symptoms, examination, functional x-rays, MRI scan, plus or minus CT, and dry arthroscopy, and what I'm finding the use of the hook test. But there's another way to see. And I found this incredibly valuable. Every patient before we operate on them gets an active range of motion and it's measured. We measure their growth strip, lateral pinch, force plate, supination and pronation. We measure their function with dash, PRWE, VAS and vascular activity. There's no ideal tool, but that's what we've got at the moment. And then what percentage power they've got in their hand throughout all these movements as we follow them up at three, six and 12 months. And fortunately, over the last two to three years, we're now approximating 70 to 80% data, which is making me feel very happy. And that gives you a great deal of confidence about what to expect if you leave something alone and what you can get when you operate. And let's just drill down to those areas where the big questions still remain. We all have big questions about this joint. What do you do? How do you stay out of trouble? How do you get the best result? So clinical examination will tell you if there's a tear, if you follow what I've said before, it doesn't define the anatomy, nor does it define the type of repair. An MRI is essential to exclude other pathology. It may or may not determine or define a tear, and it does not define the anatomy. A hook test does show you there's a tear, but it doesn't define the anatomy. Dry arthroscopy, as we've learned from Parker on shifting it into the DRUJ, in my experience, will let you see and feel the peripheral distal tear. It'll let you see and feel the foveal insertion and will allow you to do an anatomically specific repair. So in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge the help of my research assistant, Courtney Andrich, and the wonderful therapists I work with that helped me get the data that assist me make sense out of what we're doing and to continue to improve. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Jeff. Uh, we will wait, I have to relieve some uh, faculty, so we'll quick on, quickly go on to uh, Professor Pinal now. Taco, okay. over yeah. to you. Okay, let me just uh, uh, check where we are. So you're getting my, my screen right now? Are you getting my screen? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, una fractures in distal radius, okay? And uh, when we think of uh, distal radius, uh, we, that we are surgeons, we, we think of approaches and how to, to, to fix the bone, okay? And uh, I will talk about this, actually, because it is important. You know, the una style approach, the foveal approach, the una head, depending on the location of the fracture, which you need a, a different approach. But also it's very important instability because uh, this is a part of, uh, of the problems of the distal of the una joint. Be once uh, we had a fracture or an injury, the patient, the motion may not be smooth any, any longer. And there, is, there, will, there may be a clunk-like motion or a normal translation that uh, uh, trans transfer into pain for the patient, okay? He, he is an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, he had a radio fracture, not too bad, well aligned, but uh, he had instability after that. So he came for a second opinion. And that's, uh, because we have to take into consideration in a in a distal radial fracture, no 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 only the the ulna or the the, the primary stabilizers. I will talk about this, but also that this uh, radius has uh, uh, heal in slight shortening, and also some radial 
translation. And that's very important for us. Uh, I will speak about that, of the secondary stabilizer. Uh, for some time, uh, when we started on this, we thought that the one I started was the important uh, part for instability. And we have this uh, picture that was wrong, but uh, that when the, the tip of the side of as uh, rupture, there was no instability, and when the base of the stylo there was there was instability, and that's totally false. And we could see that in MRI, where uh, most of the fibers uh, of the distal of the venous joint were uh, inserted into the fovea. Okay, so you could have a not no not not even a chip fracture and have instability. And then you may have a basilar fracture of the unai stator and still have instability. And that's thanks to uh, Professor Berger and for uh, Toshi Nakamura, who had worked a lot on, uh, on the anatomy. We have uh, advanced a lot. And now uh, we, uh, as uh, Steve Moran has uh, presented before me, we have a uh, uh, stabilizers. We know what the primary stabilizer, which is the distal, the distal radomuna joint ligament that uh, have a primary insertion into the fovea and also into the unai stato, but also we have secondary stabilizers that are the unocapa ligaments, the ECU uh, sheath, and the distal oblique bundle. And they work in different ways. You know, they, they, they uh, in most fractures, uh, the primary stabilizers are gone, but uh, uh, secondary stabilizers are the ones that hold the, the, the stability of the distal radomuna joint. Okay? And, uh, but sometimes the, there is a failure of the primary stabilizer. And uh, I, will say you, I will show you now one case where this this, this uh, uh, radius fracture that actually there's not even a chip fracture. You know, the, the, the tip is intact, but the important thing to me is not what I see in the scope, which is uh, as uh, Jeff has just uh, pointed out that uh, uh, the, 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 there is a detachment from the fovea, but it, the important thing is the, the clinical part, which uh, the patient after the distal radial fixation, there is a steep instability of the distal radial joint. So for this case, what we did is to, through a mini approach on the fovea, uh, you put the HANA on supination, in supination, you can do a mini approach and you just get there into the fovea. You have to take care of the dorsal branch of the una nerve. And, uh, and then once we put a bone anchor, we, we use the uh, uh, needle to, to make a, a suture, okay? To make a, uh, to put a stitch inside the, and inside the joint and to reattach the, the, the TFC into the fovea. And these are after the, after the reattachment. And uh, at the moment we are tightening the knot, you see that the, the, there is no more instability on the TFC, okay? And uh, you see before and after the reattachment. And it's true that you never pull the same way before than after, but that's the, but it was quite stable. So that's the, the sketch of the repair, and uh, he's the patient some weeks after. Okay, and, and uh, we have uh, the idea that uh, the base of the of the ulnar stylo when it's fractured, there is no instability. But in some cases, when the fovea is also included, then you may have instability. And uh, for example, this patient had a mega stylo, and uh, but. It, and I was wonder. I mean, you you may wonder whether there is instability in this case. And for this thing, the hook test is very useful. Okay, so in this case, we can move the the whole complex to the lunate. And uh, what we are going to do is to reattach. Instead of to reattach the TFC, we are going to reattach the uh, una styloid. And for doing that, we can do that through a mini approach by using. Uh, cannulated the screws. We use uh, one K-wire to stabilize the una stylo and another one just to, to thread through it the cannulated screw. And you can do this through a very, very small approach. This is actually 6R and uh, you prolong this unally with the hand in supination, the una stylo is right there. And uh, you can use that for the fixation. So we allow this patient to start uh, immediate range of motion. You can see inside the, the joint 
that uh, now the, I'm trying to do to lift the TFC and uh, it's stable. We allow this patient to move immediately after the surgery. It's four weeks, it's one year, and, uh, and uh, full range of motion one year. Okay, secondary stabilizers are, are much more important because they are less well known and they are a cause of instability. Uh, they fail when there is axial shortening, when there is radial translation, and also depending on the type of fracture. Uh, in a, in a, we all know that in excess loprestity, there is instability of the distal radiobinal joint. And that's due in minor cases because the, the distal big bundle and the una kappa ligaments becomes incompetent. Okay, and if you do an una, uh, una shortening, everything becomes stable. That is not for, uh, is only for work for minor cases of, uh, of axillopresty. Okay, this patient, for example, has a, a radius fracture, the radius head fracture, and uh, he had instability. And after uh, una shortening, the joint became stable. So, so that's, uh, that's, in a distal radius fracture, if you don't restore the length of the of the radius heels collapse with axial shortening, you can expect that the secondary stabilizers they are not going to be working properly. The second reason of uh, of that of failure of the second stabilize of the secondary stabilizers is uh, is a quite common deformity that you see in uh, distal radius fractures. Which are which is uh, una uh, sorry radial translocation or translation. Okay, this uh, patient doesn't look to be too bad, but actually is uh, radially translated. And uh, in radial, uh, if the epiphysis is radially translocated, the distal oblique bundle and the una kappa ligaments they are not going to, to, to be tightened. They are, they are going to be loose and that would create instability. So we need to correct that and, uh, and to put it back into the normal uh, alignment. Uh, Mark Ross from uh, Brisbane has studied this uh, in detail and he has found, uh, he has found a relationship between the, the radial translation and the uh, cover or uncovering of the lunate. And uh, if the, the the lunate has to be uh, um, at least forty percent cover uh, uncover, sorry, uncover. Okay, so the, this line you you uh, trace this line from the metaphysis, and uh, in, as in this case, eighty percent of the lunate is into into the radius. That means that uh, that epiphysis needs to be uh, corrected, and to correct that. Uh, what I use is a Holman into the into the radius, which actually is a maneuver that was described by Bigas, but uh, maybe 15 years ago in uh, in uh, techniques in a not so popular journal, techniques in an, an upper extremity, and he described that technique there 15 years ago. And uh, what what you do is to hold the the, the radius uh, the diaphysis uh, radially, and then to move the the fracture and the una unally, okay? And that way you can correct the, the thin. And uh, you see this uh, in fluoroscopy, how I'm doing, uh, I'm using the Holman to move the, the shaft uh, radially and then pushing the hand uh, and the fracture unally, okay? And after the reduction, you see that now it looks the same, but it's not the same because most of the lunate now is uh, on the una side of the of the radius is out of the of, of the radial surface, and uh, this was the case of uh, that I showed you before. You know the patient had instability because uh, the the secondary stabilizers are failed. There is a slight shortening of the radius, and at the same time there is a slight uh, radial translation of the of the una, and that's enough for the secondary stabilizers to fail. If you work on the distal radial joint ligament and you don't treat the, the problem of the alignment of the radius, you won't succeed. So you need to, actually it's more important to correct the, the, the radius, to lengthen the radius or to shorten the una, but also to correct the, the 
uh, to provide the radio the translation that these radios had. And also, the, the, the secondary st stabilizers fail when, uh, depending on the type of fracture. In this uh, sketch, what I use is to put in red what uh, is important for uh, stability. Stability, and uh, uh, as you see, the TFC is not so important. Some uh, sometimes in some uh, complex uh, uh, injuries there may be instability, but uh, in most is green, which means that there is no uh, disability instability. But uh, rim of the of the radios neck or metaphyses uh, of the radios they make they will cause uh, instability. Let me show you about rim fractures. Uh, because this patient, for example, had a, a recapa dislocation. Um, but I bring this case here for the distal radio nigel instability. Uh, it doesn't look too bad, this uh, the, the distal radio nigel, but here there is a piece of bone missing. We know that because of the CT scan. Okay, there is a piece, the dorsal uh, una corner of the radius is missing, and that, as you know, contains the distal, the distal radio nigel uh, dorsal. This is radio una joint ligament, okay, and uh, and the, the una is already dislocated, and this type of uh, small fragments, but uh, we, we control them under uh, arthroscopy uh, by uh, if they are too small, if they are big enough, we put a K wire, but otherwise, what we do is to to use a, a smooth K wire to keep to keep there for three or four weeks, and then uh, allow range of motion. So this is the. This is a view from uh, three, four portal. This is the, the dosa, una corner of the radius. And we are uh, with the scope. Um, I'm going to put it back. Okay, sorry. I'm going to put it back. We are with the KY. We go inside the joint. So because these small uh, fragments are very small and we want, we want to go just subchondral. So we uh, put uh, remove a bit back the, the um, KY and then we go just subchondral. Okay, and that's, now is the reduction. At the end, uh, we kept uh, immobilized for three weeks and this is the patient nine weeks after. And uh, this is the X-ray three years after and the stability of the distal radio in a chain. This is actually the hole for the KY. But the patient has a full range of motion, no instability. Okay. Okay, one, uh, uh, I know that uh, some of the audience is not very keen on, on arthroscopy and, uh, and, uh, and arthroscopy for some reason, uh, at some stages, what happened, what happened at the beginning is that we overdiagnose some of the, of the injuries and that uh, made us lose credibility. And uh, I think that the important thing is to combine the findings on arthroscopy to the findings on uh, clinical examination, a bit what uh, Jeff uh, Ecker has just said. Uh, this patient, for example, uh, it could be, has also a similar injury to the, to the one I showed you before. There is a, uh, the dorsal una corner of the radius is, uh, is fractured and here's the ligament, okay? As, as the case before, okay? And when we put, uh, let me show you, let me go forward. When we put the scope in, uh, you see that uh, this is the TFC. There is some rupture because this patient is a degenerative rupture. But uh, here's the dorsa una corner of the radius. Looks to be unstable, okay? But uh, clinically, the patient was stable. So we didn't do anything. We allow her to uh, uh, meet a branch of motion. We just fixed the, the radius. And this is her at 10 days and didn't have any problem. So uh, the important thing about arthroscopy in my view, is that uh, it's a complement to the to the physical examination. If you only use physical examination, you're going to miss lots of things. But if you use the findings of arthroscopy without thinking of the clinical examination, then you are going to overtreat patients. Okay, neck fractures. Let's move to another thing. Neck fracture. Uh, the neck fracture has to be fixed because otherwise uh, there, there's going to be pain and. Uh, the, the, there is going to be instability, but I, I've, I brought this uh, into this talk because one of the problems that we have is with the plates. That's a, a, a normal plate, but uh, you see, patient will be complaining for at least one year until I remove the plate. Okay, so 
what I've been moving from this uh, even uh, modern uh, plates are still too large in my view. So what I'm using now is cannulated screws or or very low profile uh, plates from Medartis, which actually they are intended to treat uh, metacarpals, but uh, they work well for also for ulnar fracture. And uh, uh, what um, the reason I started to use uh, uh, cannulated screw into the ulna were a bit uh, because we treated metacarpa and uh, and phalanges fractures, phalangeal fractures with uh, cannulated screws. We published this in the American Journal, but it would take no imagination to do the same thing into the into the into the ulna because it worked the same way. So uh, this is a fracture of a uh, extraarticular fracture, but also had a, a neck fracture here, not too combinated. And for her, a bit the same as we insert the the TFC TFCC anchors. If you put the hand in, in supination, the phobia is right there. Okay, you need just a small incision, provided you are in supination. Because if, if you put it in neutral, all these structures will be in the way. But if you put in supination, the phobia, as I am intended to show you in this uh, schematic drawing, is right there. Okay, so in uh, this is the patient. Okay, in supination, here's the phobia. And in this case, the TFC is there because there's no rupture. So we, we put here a cannulated screw and allow her uh, immediate range of motion is five weeks. And uh, in more complex cases, you can also use more than one screw. There's one screw for the una style or another screw for the head proper. And here's the patient four weeks. And uh, here's the patient, I think one year after. With uh, for supination. Comminuted uh, net fractures, they obviously, uh, they need a, a plate too, this type of fractures. But again, if you use this uh, uh, low profile plates, as I sh I'm intending to show here, uh, they are very thick. I will use one case uh, after with a 2.7 millimeter plate, but I prefer to use even lower profile. And this is my preferred plate from Medartis. I have nothing to do with any company, but uh, this plate is pretty good because the screws can be uh, they can be locked into the plate. Okay, and I use a una head approach, and for this patient, these uh, screws here are locked and allow the patient to start uh, range of motion. This is two weeks, and uh, this is two weeks after. This one year. And, uh, and this is what I would like to highlight is how the plate is still in place and there is the contour. This patient has not had any pain in the ulnar uh, part of the gene, which is a problem with, uh, uh, with higher profile plates. Okay, this is a case where it's a bit uh, more complicated because uh, apart from the instability of the distal radio ulnar, this is a bit like a floating elbow because there is a fracture of the base of the ulnar stylo, but also a bone missing here. There is a intra-articular distal radio fracture. Apart from that, a, a, a nice uh, big hole here. Devascularization of the hand. So we did some uh, vein graft and uh, for, uh, uh, for as an emergency, we just put a temporary uh, um, temporary stigma fixator. And uh, four days later, we went back and we treated the with the arthroscope, the distal radius fracture. Okay. Which, uh, and, uh, and we fixed partially the ulnar problem. Okay, so we fixed the radius because we had a lot of surgery to do for this patient. We had to, we put this 2.7, uh, millimeter plate with this gap that we left for another week. Uh, but for the day, we did the out of surgery. We did, we did the fixation, we did the ulnar, the radius. We put, put also a free flap here for the hole. And a week later, we lift the flap and we restore the ulnar defect with a media femoral condom that was described by Dr. Doi. And uh, we wrap 
this flap around the una. You can use obviously non-vascularized bone graft, but non-vascularized bone graft would take very long and you will have to keep the plate for very long. We remove the plate at six months after this surgery. We allow him uh, immediate range of motion and pronosupination. And this is nine months after. Okay, with uh, nine months, three free flaps. He had three free flaps and two revascularization. But uh, the good thing about this patient is that uh, uh, even if you do, it, you do it by stages, in stages, you can have very fast, uh, a good result and uh, a good uh, range of motion. I can't do that. So he's much better than me because I can't do that. And so to sum up, uh, not only think of the fracture, you know, think of the distal radial major instability, which may keep the, the patient much more prone than the fracture itself. And uh, just to, to, to share with you uh, the problems that we may have with the material, with the, with the, with the hardware. Okay. And I think this is all from my side. You know, I don't know if uh, any question, Pankas, or any comment? Thanks, uh, Professor Pinal. Any questions for Paco? Because he has given me an ultimatum. He wants to leave at uh, 6 30. Uh, so before he gets annoyed with me and refuses to join me next time, any questions uh, for Professor Pinal? Professor Gebor, you said something. You want to say add something? No. Uh, Dr. Mira, you were here. You're gone. Gone. Professor Eckert, you want to say something? No, except uh, it's inherently sensible. And I think some of those cases were absolutely superb with wonderful results. I mean, uh, I have nothing to add except uh, admire the cases and the talk. OK, Mark, you want to add something here? Mark, you have to unmute yourself, please. Mark, you have to unmute. Mark, you have to unmute, please. Unmuted, yes. Yes. Now, yes. Paco has always has uh, amazing technique and spot on. I also use the retrograde cannulated screws for the distal ulnar fractures. I also use the med artist plate for the more complex and comminuted neck fractures, just as he showed actually use a, a single row plate, put it volarly. Uh, it's even more low profile and it's plenty strong even to bridge across comminution there. It's fine. It works well just as he does. This is uh, the advanced edge that we're doing in complex trauma and he's spot on and I support it hundred uh, percent. And the MFC flap, I, I use a lot. Um, it's very good for those gap zones and it's much nicer heals much better than long ago you'd use a fibula but mfc you can take up to six centimeters and it's great flap okay sans you want to add something here yeah no uh paco always gives an amazing talk he's a magician uh he didn't he didn't ask me to say this but i would uh, urge everybody he has a wonderful book on uh the role of dry wrist arthroscopy and distal radius fractures and it shows some of the techniques the other thing that he uh, that I want to highlight that he taught me was the clinical examination as well. And and sometimes um, when you examine the wrist and an ulnar deviation and the DIEJ will feel unstable, but when you radially deviate, if it tightens up, then the secondary stabilizers are intact. And so you, those are the wrists that sometimes you don't actually need to do anything for. And uh, again, uh, echo what Paco had taught me about that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, Richard, that's, you uh, want to add something? Oh, sorry, Paco, please go no, ahead. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to make uh, any advertisement of my of any of my books because I make the 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 my money operating. But uh, just just some people may find uh, helpful just to to to. Oop, I, I thought I was going to to show you something, but uh, but uh, I was going to show you this. Uh, I don't know if I can. This book, you know, is out uh, totally uh, out of print, and, but you can get it in uh, internet, I think, for free. And this one, the same. Uh, as I said, I don't make my money operator, but here in this book, in both, there are many of the people who is now uh, talking, and uh, there is a lot of science here because, uh, is uh, as uh, Pankas uh, said, in one square centimeter, there are uh, 
50 different pathologies and uh, they all need uh, uh, to be careful, search for because or sought for because otherwise you may end up treating what uh, when what you, what you don't have, which is uh, uh, you know they they tend we tend to treat the obvious like a ulna plus or or a, but ulna plus may mean nothing in a in a in a patient and in the other as uh, Steve Moran has shown a ulna neutra may cause a massive ulna impaction. So it's uh, I, I think this is uh, as you said uh, very very complicated and uh, we need to be paying a lot of attention to all of what uh, all all the different structures that may be causing pain. Sorry to interrupt okay. you. Uh, Richard, you want to add something here? Um, no, not specifically. I uh, I, I know that uh, Paco uh, operates as well as he drives his Porsche. And um, <laughs> um, uh, I've been with him and, um, well, I have nothing to add. It's good. It's very good. Okay. Stephen, okay, fine. Stephen, you want to add something there? No, it's fantastic. Uh, because you have you do a lot of scopies, you want to add something? Uh, Paco is unbelievable. I I just too many I have attended. This is the third time I'm hearing him is uh, just amazing. I uh, thank you very much, Pin uh, Paco. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's up to you. Uh, you're most welcome to stay on. You said 6:30. I think I'm on dot to have uh, okay. taken your time. Thank you, Pin okay, uh, Paco. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, we now. Uh, Richard, uh, I know you said you have family commitments. You want to interrupt and get, take you in, or can we go yeah. for the schedule? Yes, yeah, so, so to speak. Uh, Stephen, just ten minutes, please. Actually, uh, um, Richard. First, uh, uh, let me say again that I'm uh, most uh, uh, honoured to make a small contribution. Uh, as this is my first time, I didn't understand uh, uh, what actually my role was, so I didn't prepare for any slides. But as I understand, um, my role is to say a few words on uh, my technique or that we developed in our clinic uh, for stabilization of due instability, right? And um, that, um, well, if, if anyone is interested, they can find the information in two uh, things. That is uh, first a textbook uh, from uh, Slutsky and um, Osterman the fractures and injuries of the distal radius and carpus, the cutting edge, there they can find um, the technique and otherwise in the journal, the wrist in 2013 uh, under dorsal uh, capsuloplasty for dorsal instability of the distal ulna. Okay, uh, unfortunately I do not have slides. So you, uh, I will give a short comment on my idea of stabilizing the distal ulna joint in general. Um, and in my point, it's a three point stability that is important. And uh, this is um, perhaps, uh, as I said, I don't have slides, but I try to figure out this is the radius, that is the ulna. Here is the dorsal radio ulna ligament. There's the volar and here's the fovea. Now that's, one point, two point, and three point. So drill, drill, and the fovea. Now, if we can stabilize two of these structures, in my uh, hands, usually we can recreate stability. Um, now, uh, what is very important is that usually the fovea, um, the fovea is stable, but where, in my view, most of the cases cre uh, create instability is where the dorsal radio ulna joint um, uh, coincides or, 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 or fuses with the collateral ligament. If there is an attenuation there, then the ulnar head may come up. So in our uh, uh, procedures, we focus very much on this area. Of course, we have to um, do investigation before, like physical examination and um, x-ray to exclude any fractures, to, uh, to exclude any uh, osseous uh, uh, problems. Um, 
we do always a dry arthroscopy. We use the needle technique, of course, uh, or the, uh, uh, yeah, the needle technique to see what the, uh, the stability of the TFC is. Um, usually we see at the dorsal side, some degenerative changes of the structures of the uh, dorsal radial ulnar ligament. And unfortunately, I can't show you, but usually that area is, um, is, is sort of covered with a layer of inflamed uh, synovium. So we remove that by shaving it away. And then we often see that the tissue has not the normal structure. And that is for, for me, the sign um, that that may be the cause of the, uh, of the painful instability of the distal radial ulnar joint, especially when people usually have pain in this area. So not in the foveal area, but at the dorsal side of the uh, wrist. Now focusing on that uh, area, we do then a dorsal capsuloplasty by an approach which opens through the sixth extensor uh, area, um, ex extending it to the radiodorsal side. And um, then we have a view on the dorsal capsule. We enter, we make an incision just on the distal edge of the ulnar head and at the area of the ulnocarpal joint. And that is by freeing the dorsal radio ulnar ligament. So you, with your, you can grab that with an instrument and uh, because you freed, of course, then the dorsal side of the TFC. And if we put the position then in, a, in the wrist in a neutral position, in a neutral position, that's very important. We can take the, or I, I, I put my, no, um, take it with a pin set and reattach it under tension to that collateral uh, ligament. You and this, uh, I hope I, I, I can make myself clear. If not, please interrupt me. So the dorsal radio ulnar ligament, which we freed by these two small incisions, we under tension with the wrist in a neutral position, reposition and fix it to the collateral uh, uh, tissues around the ulnar hand. That is a procedure which is very, very easy and which has in our hands at least uh, uh, in most of the cases success. If by arthroscopy or by inspecting because you have the TFC loose then, so you can in the meantime already inspect or test the foveal area. If, we, if there's any doubt that the foveal area is also loose or too attenuated, we can fix the foveal area by a transosseous stitch to the ulna. So that in that case, we fixed two points of the three. Usually the palmar ligament is uh, not injured. So then we have recreated three point stability by that. Is that more or less clear? All right. So this is, this is the technique uh, which, you can, which you can also find in the wrist or at this, uh, with this book of Osterman and uh, Slutsky. But um, it's a very easy procedure as long um, as you're not afraid to open the six extensor uh, uh, compartment and uh, extend your incision over the, uh, over the ulna uh, towards the radial side. All right, I have uh, time. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you well. Okay, uh, I have a slide of uh, this dorsal uh, capsular imbrication, if time permits, and if you are there, you can comment on that. I have a few slides, as and when my time comes, ch chance comes, I'll share with those slides. Uh, okay. uh, can I invite Professor Sanj Kakar? I think he wants to go. He has some emergency there. So, uh, uh, Stephen, if you can permit for 10 minutes, please. Sanj, are you there? Yes, no, I'm, Sanj, I'm Sanj, here. Sanj, Thank, please, go ahead. Thanks, Pankaj. Um, just... 
Can you uh, you can see that? Yes. Okay, let me just go on to. Okay, thank you, uh, Pankaj and the uh, Indian Orthopedic Association. It uh, truly is an honor to be here today. And uh, as uh, some wonderful teachings from the speakers before, just wanted to give a framework uh, for our audience in terms of how uh, potentially they can try and put this all together uh, as we hear some wonderful treatments for ulnar sided wrist pain. Uh, it'd be remiss of me not to thank uh, Mark Garcia Elias and Dick Berger. As, as Steve has mentioned, Dick has been instrumental in our understanding of the ulnar side of the wrist, uh, as well as uh, Mark through their teachings over the years. So I want to start off with a case uh, of a, a tennis player comes in with ulnar wrist pain, uh, couldn't hit his double-handed backhand. And, and the key thing, as we heard earlier, was you really have to elucidate the myriad of different areas that can cause pain. So clinically, he was point tender of the fovea. Uh, Steve nicely showed us the, the foveal sign. He also had a positive ECU synergy test, and that's a nice test. So when you fully supinate the forearm and you ask patients to resist abduction of their thumb and index finger, essentially what happens is that the ECRL will fire. And so your brain to keep the wrist in neutral rotation will fire the ECU. So before you've touched these patients, because they can really be guarding with their clinical exam, uh, you can do this nice test, which will tell you ECU pathology. And so you can see these are the x-rays and essentially these are normal. And so uh, in terms of when you see a patient with ul ulnar wrist pain, obviously many of us, uh, it can be an overwhelming uh, problem, but hopefully uh, through the course of this webinar, it gives you a sort of framework how to sort of build off this. You know, you can, it can be overwhelming. You know, this is just a simple slide showing the different types of pathologies. And so to try and have one, sort of treatment to, to treat all of these would be obviously impossible to do. And, and the key thing here uh, is to understand the different pathologies uh, that exist. Uh, it can be bony, it can be cartilage, it can be soft tissue. And as you've shown nicely in the uh, anatomy, to try and put that into one area can be difficult, but it's important because if you fail to treat them, they're not mutually exclusive. And if you treat them as mutually exclusive of events, that's where you get into problems. So is there an easier way to remember this? And as a result, uh, hopefully end uh, 30 years of hurt that we recently done and, and won the Premier League title. So Steve mentioned uh, the, the uh, questions, and this was sort of teaching by Dick Berger, who, who taught us these three questions, uh, who uh, recently wrote a nice article on this in terms of breaking it down into those three uh, buckets that Steve mentioned, be that pain, be that pain with instability, and, and pain with arthritis. And I, and I hear when you think, well, they all are the same, but they're actually not. And I think if you ask the patients critically when they're having the pain, you can really break it down uh, into this. Uh, Mark uh, taught us the uh, concept of the four leaf clover algorithm. Uh, and I wanna share this with you. And it's essentially four key questions that you ask a patient when you see. So when you look at this patient who has gross DIUJ instability, is this a bony problem? Is it a soft tissue problem or is it both? And, and I think if you fail to answer those questions, that's where you'll do a great operation in surgery, uh, but can fail. So in terms of how do we use this algorithm? Uh, essentially, you ask these key, key questions. Is there a bony problem, yes or no? Uh, Paco showed that case of that extra articular distal radius fracture, which had some radial translation of the distal fragment. And if you fail to address that and just do a soft tissue pr procedure, it would fail. Is there a cartilage problem? Yes or no? Is there arthritis? What about the quality of the static stabilizer? So we heard about the nature of the TFCC as the most important, but not the only one. And is it a dynamic problem? And I've put, for example, the ECU, which is the most common sort of dynamic problem we'll see on the ulnar side of the wrist. So you ask these questions and you go through this uh, one by one. So what about this patient? So this is, an, uh, believe it or not, a very active tennis player who came to see me, couldn't play tennis, uh, despite non-operative treatment. And when you look at his uh, MRI, uh, clinically, he was uh, tender over the fovea, his DIUJ was stable, and was non-tender over the ECU. So going through this checklist, in my mind, this was a soft tissue problem, most likely a TFCC or a UT ligament split tear. 
So this is a, a short video, just wanna share with you. Uh, Jeff uh, showed us nicely uh, the power of dry wrist arthroscopy. Uh, and really uh, many people have taught us this. Um, obviously Paco has been a champion teaching us the power of dry wrist arthroscopy. So it's just a, a small incision in the three, four portal. And uh, just take your time. I know uh, many of the audience uh, may be new to arthroscopy. Uh, you don't need to put fluid into the joint. Uh, you can see it's uh, relatively minimally invasive and you put the uh, camera in. So this is a, um, a 1.9 millimeter camera as uh, Jeff mentioned. And once you've got your camera, uh, essentially you're now looking for the uh, best portal, be that the four, five or the six R. You'll see there's a syringe there on the bottom left. That's uh, the uh, uh, automatic washout technique uh, taught to us by uh, Paco del Pinal uh, in, for distal radius fractures, but you can do this for any sort of dry arthroscopy. Uh, and essentially what you're doing is you're hooking up the shaver just to irrigate the joint. And so when you get in there, uh, naturally this is an older patient has a central tear. So don't be fooled by the pathology. Remember your clinical examination. That is key when you're treating ulnar-sided wrist pain. So essentially here, we're just debriding out here as a loose fragment. And I think for me, clinically, what I find useful is to see where that synovitis is. And so this uh, patient was tender over the fovea. So we're just debriding it. You have a nice view. And now you can get to the pathology. And so uh, Steve showed uh, those nice diagrams of the UT ligament split tear. So essentially what we're doing here is just debriding, getting rid of all that synovitis. And once you can do that, then the split tear will uh, manifest itself. And so uh, the key part here is to uh, debride the um, split tear and then repair it. And I think you have to get back to healthy bleeding tissue here. Um, so once we've done this, uh, we'll then make a small ulnar-sided incision, uh, as you can see here. And a couple of little technical tricks. So this is volar to the ECU. And um, Dick Berger taught us that once you find a vein there, the basilic vein, you just move this out of harm's way and the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve is right there. So there's the vein, it's always there. And if you spread, you'll see the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. A little trick though is once you found one branch, there's other branches there as well. And so uh, you have to take your time in coming under finding all the branches, because there's nothing worse than putting sutures here and injuring the nerve. Uh, and so you, I'll take in the vein actually with the nerve here itself, and you put a Vessi loop uh, around this. Um, and then uh, actually this patient had an aberrant branch going in a, in a slightly wrong direction, going from dorsal to volar, but you can actually see it right there. And so once you found again, one branch, just take your time and remove that out of harm's way. And then uh, you can do a simple sort of outside to inside technique. And I think uh, others will be showing uh, this technique later. So in terms of uh, post-operative planning, uh, these patients are uh, splinted for six weeks before they start treatment. And uh, we looked up our series here and we had 96 patients and overwhelmingly the patients did well. They did have some numbness of the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve, which is to be expected, but these resolved. So that was pretty straightforward. So that's a TFCC problem. Well, if there's a bony problem that we heard earlier on, you have to fix that. So here you could do a corrective osteotomy. If there's a arthritis of the DIUJ, again, with using the four leaf clover, address your treatment to that. So this is an ulnar head replacement. And finally, if the ECU is unstable, you need to address that. So that's pretty straightforward. That was one problem. What about two problems? So back to our case. So this is a patient who had problems of the TFCC and also of the ECU. So here you can see the MRI scan. Key thing when you're treating ECU pathology is to remember, don't treat the uh, MRI, treat the patient. So this is the st uh, static uh, MRI, and you can see actually the yellow arrow should show you where the ECU should be. So you can see it's only subluxated, but this may be normal. So I think here it's useful to get the ultrasound probe out and compare both sides to see if tr this truly is pathological. So again, now, so we're going to go back to this patient. Bone looked good, cartilage looked good, had a TFCC problem and an ECU. So when we go into the operating room, we want to address both of these. So arthroscopically, we address the UT split tear. You can see here it's repaired. But the mistake here is now to stop. You have to address the other pathology. So now we go to the ECU and do whatever stabilization procedure that you want to do. So what about this patient? This is a patient of mine who had a relatively straightforward distal radius fracture uh, and uh, I plated her. If I was being critical, maybe uh, the tilt could be better, uh, but overall I thought she was doing okay. But she comes back eight months later 
complaining of ulnar-sided wrist pain. And you can see these are bilateral true PA radiographs. Normal is on the left and the injured one is on the right. So if I'm critical, I thought her ulnar variance was actually okay. This is her clinical exam. So you can see she has gross DIEJ instability. So this is eight months post-op. So if we go back to that four-leaf clover, is there a bony problem? Yes, yeah, she has ulnar impaction, but she clearly also has a foveal injury as well, or instability of the DIEJ. As Paco showed us, I looked at the, uh, the Mark Ross tech, um, uh, technique, and I thought my actual radial translation was good. And so here uh, we're doing the dry arthroscopy, and you can see she has a complete foveal detachment uh, where I can easily lift that off. And, and Jeff showed us nice videos where the fovea was completely incompetent. So here we can make sure we get good pronosupination because if we're gonna do an arthroscopic wafer in this case, you have to go uh, dorsal and volar to ensure that you don't leave a bony rim. So here now we're bringing in the uh, shaver through the DIEJ portal that uh, Jeff showed me how to make actually many years ago and it works very nicely, lifting up the TFCC and you can see we're debriding the uh, articular cartilage uh, where the impaction is happening. And now you're taking the burr and you can see we're in full pronation. The assistant is holding this. I can get as dorsal as I can, but the mistake is just to do dorsal. You have to fully pronosupinate so you get the whole area of the ulnar head. And so now here you can see we're uh, going into full pronation, making sure we've got every remnant of this. And if you don't, when you take an X-ray, it looks like you actually haven't taken much bone. So there you can see, so now we've done the um, uh, wafer procedure. But the mistake again, remember, is the, uh, she also has other path pathologies. So she has a uh, foveal detachment. So this is a technique actually by Wei Jen, popularized in Taiwan. We found the dorsal central branch of the ulnar nerve. We're coming volar to the ECU. We're incising the extensor retinaculum. And what we're gonna do now is a, an arthroscopically assisted uh, foveal uh, repair of that TFCC. So there's the DIEJ portal. I'm just taking the shaver and we're gonna debride all the foveal uh, uh, insertional aspects for the TFCC so we get to a bleeding bone. And you can alternate between your DIEJ and your 6R. So this is a 0.062 KY. We're looking at this coming through the fovea and technically there we're slightly dorsal. We have to be a little bit more volar and that's the beauty of dry wrist arthroscopy. You can adjust this and now we're sort of lifting our hand and it's just a few millimeters and we're getting that uh, KY going more volar. And there you can see it coming through. So once we've done this now, what we'll, what we'll do is um, we're going to now uh, shuttle our sutures uh, through this. I'll just show you one or two passes. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll uh, move on. So now I can ensure that the TFCC is fully uh, mobile. I've released all the uh, attachments peripherally. And so I take a, an 18 gauge needle, put it through the, uh, the bone and take a looped PDS. And so now you pull out the loop PDS through the 6R portal and we can actually repeat this twice. The hole is big enough to allow you to put four strands uh, of uh, suture uh, through this. So there you can see the needle coming up through the um, uh, bony tunnel. Uh, the uh, grasper is in the 6R portal, and then the uh, stitch will come through and we'll pull that loop out. So now we have two loops of uh, two OPDS uh, through the bone and through the fovea. And what we'll next do now is just cut one of the loops, okay? And now what we'll do is uh, take a needle and actually come through the TFCC in the capsule. Here we got a 20 gauge needle uh, coming in. And uh, what we're gonna do now is take a bite of the TFCC. Uh, we'll use this uh, suture here as our shuttle stitch. And so what we'll do is push this through and then uh, through that 6R portal, uh, again, you can see there's really no fluid needed. And, and so this will uh, prevent there being uh, soft tissue extravasation. So you pull the needle back, you pull out the uh, suture through the 6R portal, and then you take a limb of that uh, stitch that we cut and then shuttle it through. And you essentially do this uh, four times and that will give you a very nice uh, repair to the foveal side. So in the interest of time, we'll just move on. So that was showing it in a chronic situation. What about this? Uh, can we use this in an acute situation? So what about this patient? You can see a uh, trip and fall has a distal radius fracture, but actually the bone isn't a problem. Look at the diastasis of the sigmoid notch. 
So when you look at the CT scan, there's just a small dorsal on the corner. That is not enough injury there to cause that type of problem. So the mistake here is just be fixing the radius and, and leaving it alone. So going back to the four leaf clover, she has a bony problem. She has a distal radius fracture, uh, but also most likely has a TFCC problem. So here, what I did is went volar, kept my screws short on the uh, volar on the side, then went dorsal, reducing that dorsal on the corner, noting in the TFCC of the fovea. And so now you can see uh, with that uh, dorsal on the corner reduced, the DIJ immediately reduces, and then the fovea was repaired. Just lastly, so that was two problems. What about three problems? So this is a patient that comes in to see me, had a previous radial hell excision, and then had a DARA procedure. And so essentially you can see how that uh, forearm uh, is floating. So if you go through the checklist, you can see there's a bony problem. Uh, there's uh, issues at the DIEJ and most likely the TFCC at this stage several years later is non-functional. This is a classic uh, Shecker view um, and essentially was uh, fixed with this uh, linked prosthesis. So I think in summary, undecided wrist pain as you've seen during the course of the webinar and we'll C is a difficult problem, but if you have a nice checklist, that will allow you to sort of uh, individualize your treatments. Just briefly, just want to uh, recognize the Hand Society, and uh, they have a nice um, uh, app called Hand E, which allows you, it's actually uh, anybody can join, it's, it's free, and it gives you a lot of surgical techniques and surgical videos and uh, lectures from the Hand Society to help with your education. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sanj. Any question for Sanj before he leaves? And if none, can I now invite Professor Stephen Moran to talk about uh, chronic DRUG uh, in stipulate. That's a very important talk because a lot of our patients present late when the TFCC cannot be repaired. Uh, thanks, Sanj. If you want to hang on, please, uh, you are most welcome because a lot of questions will come in. Uh, suit yourself. Uh, Professor Stephen, please. Thank you. So uh, this, this talk is really for those patients that uh, you see late. Um, Dr. Berger used to feel that if a patient had gone over six months uh, with instability, it was probably not possible to fix the, uh, the bony injury. However, I think that um, as Jeff has shown and Paco has shown and Sanj, I think a lot of these chronic injuries uh, may benefit from uh, one attempt at um, arthroscopic or, or mini open repair. I'm gonna start with a case, a 15 year old uh, young woman who came to see me with persistent wrist pain four months after a fall on a wrist. She, was, she had guarding and she actually had no motion of her wrist at all. This, she'd been seen by several other uh, doctors and was sent to see us. I think if you look at that x-ray and uh, thinking back to the talks that we've already heard, you can see that maybe there is a problem between the radius and the ulna. There's some overlap, but on the lateral view, there's not gross uh, volar dorsal dislocation. This was her MRI that was from the outside institution and clearly a problem with their radiologist reading this. You can see uh, just looking at these coronal views that the uh, ulna and the radius are not even in the same image and that when we look here on the axials uh, this young woman has been dealing with a distal ulnar joint dislocation now for for four months so the bulk of chronic druj instability is due to the fact that as uh, dr kokar has just shown you there was an unseen bony problem that has not been fixed. And whether this is the dorsal ulnar corner of your distal radius fracture that wasn't stabilized properly, or it was a missed avulsion fracture, uh, those need to be corrected first. So the, the technique that I'm going to show you is really for patients who corrected with, a, with an osteotomy, which is going to be obviously much uh, easier to perform than what I'm going to show you here. There has been a variety of soft tissue procedures designed since the 1930s. And if you ever see a diagram like this, you know that none of them work very well. Uh, the most recent one was by Dr. Shecker uh, prior to his uh, invention of the aptus implant. And this was almost a shoelace type repair between the ulna and the radius attempting to stabilize not only the distal radial joint, but the interosseous membrane as well. 
in uh, 2000, actually uh, Dick Berger and Brian Adams, they were co-residents together at the University of Iowa doing their orthopedic residency and have been lifelong friends, were drawing on a napkin at a meeting uh, this reconstruction and essentially as I showed you in the first uh, uh, talk, this really was an attempt to reconstruct the Palmer and the dorsal radial ulnar ligament using a free tendon graft. So it is a tenodesis procedure uh, that attempts to reconstruct the two most important components that stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint. And they published their series in 2002, and they had 14 patients, and 12 of them were improved. There were two patients with persistent instability, and that was due to a deficient sigmoid notch that we talked about in ulnar carpal instability. And again, the deficient sigmoid notch is this flat faced here. Again, uh, this is attempting to reconstruct the two most important stabilizers of the DRUJ, the dorsal and palmar radial ulnar ligaments. The technique, and I'm going to spend some time because we haven't really talked about it, the open approach to the DRUJ is essentially just recreating this triangle. You're gonna drill through the uh, radius very close to the sigmoid notch, and then you're gonna drill a hole in the fovea exiting out the ulnar aspect of the ulnar below the styloid and essentially tie this together. Now, Mark uh, Henry is gonna describe his, uh, his technique, which makes this much uh, simpler. I will say that we have adopted Mark's uh, modification of this uh, by simply, instead of wrapping the tendon around the neck using a, a, a suture anchor and, and occasionally an interference screw. So we approach this through this, the extensor digitiminimi compartment. So we're gonna be going through the fifth compartment of the wrist that is our uh, ubiquitous exposure to the TFCC. It allows uh, for a ligament sparing approach to the carpus. As uh, Dr. Kokar mentioned to you, the, uh, once you make the skin incision, you identify and protect the dorsal ulnar sensory branch, which is always running volar or palmar to that basilic vein. Then we go through the fifth compartment. We're going to open that up. And then you can free your retinacular flap ulnarly over the ECU subsheath. And it's important to remember, you can expose the ECU. In fact, I always do, because all I'm not going to violate is the second, this subsheath that's going to stabilize the ECU from subluxing postoperatively. But I need to see this space, because my sutures in the capsule, when I repair this, are going to be passed through this tight sub. Uh, uh, subsheath, which is really, you can lift the patient's wrist up off the table if you grab this. This is what you need to be grabbing with your suture on the way out. So here we have the retinaculum opened, and then I draw your attention to the fact that the EDM is retracted radially, and then this vessel is the fifth intercompartmental vessel described by Alan Bishop. It'll connect with the fourth. I will cut through this vessel. That is your key to developing your retinacular flap. So I'm going to be cutting through this vessel. You can see it's been bovied here, but you want to identify that fifth intercompartmental vessel and then open it up. When we do uh, vascularized bone grafts for Keenbox disease, this is obviously a very important uh, vessel for us to save, but in this case, this is guiding you to your incision to open up this retinacular flap. EDM is here. You can see the two slips of the EDM, the ECU, retinaculum, and here's the ulnar head, and here's our uh, expo where our exposure will be for the capsule. This is going to be a uh, almost a rectangularly based flap, and it's going to expose not only the ulnar head, the TFCC, but the LT, which is going to be important for us uh, later on. Here's the flap. Here's the exposure. Here's the outer portion of the capsule. If you open that up, you have a clear definition between your ulnar head, your TFCC, your fovea. This is, so this would be the exposure I would use in the first talk you heard me uh, showing those open repairs of the TFCC. And then up here is going to be your uh, lunate and your triquetrum and the potential for an LT injury will be up here. So there's the fovea and that's where we're gonna be drilling our oblique uh, angled uh, channel for our tendon graft. And then during the repair, this gives you stout fibers of the periphery of the TFCC, the fovea, and you can anchor that capsular flap back down to the TFCC. Uh, and I put sutures, as I stated, in the subsheath of the ECU tendon. So if we look at it from uh, an axial view, we're coming through the floor of the EDM, so the dorsum of the wrist, and then you're going to need an incision palmarly for your tunnel through the distal radius. 
And the approach that I take is actually a midline approach through the carpus. I then come ulnar and there's a nice plane between the neurovascular bundle and the FCU going to the ulnar side and all the flexors going radially. And that leaves you a nice approach to the uh, radius, the sigmoid notch and the pronator. And this is, so I'll drill from dorsal to Palmer for the radial tunnel. And then as you saw, I will uh, drill essentially through a dorsal approach to create my ulnar channel. And this is what will look like after you've reconstructed the patient. So here's a patient that's grossly dislocated on the axials. Again, gross instability in the operating room. You can see it's not a huge incision. Uh, this is the dorsal approach. We've raised our retinacular capsule. You have to put the hand on a stacked towels so the wrist goes into flexion. You're then able to identify the fovea with a K wire and then we just will drill a cannulated tunnel through the outside of the ulna. The radial tunnel is very easy to do and you're just drilling straight down through the carpus and then we pass a piece of allograft. Originally we used the patient's palmaris but we found, as I'll show you in a second, there's really no difference and this is just allograft being passed through uh, uh, using a Houston tendon passer through these bone tunnels. This is then um, looped through the ulna and then brought back around the neck of the ulna. And then we're going to bring the patient into neutral to stabilize this reconstruction. I place all of my sutures in the capsule and then bring the patient into neutral, anchor the tendon graft onto the ulnar shaft, and then tie all the sutures down. It's uh, one of the mistakes that you can make is tying this with the patient in full pronation um, with the dorsum of the wrist exposed to you on, on the operating room table, you I lift the hand up, elbow flex to 90. I have the assistant stabilize the DRUJ relationship, and then I tension the, the uh, graft or allograft and anchor it to the ulnar neck. So uh, this procedure has been done for over 15 years here. Uh, we wrote an outcome study looking at uh, uh, my patients along with Dr. Berger's patients. We had 95 reconstructions in 93 patients with uh, almost a six year follow-up. And we found that of those 95 reconstructions, 90% 90 of them were stable following surgery. 75% uh, of them had no to minimal pain. And nothing is perfect. And 12 patients did require revisions and the average time to revision was 13 months. The things that were associated with revision were female gender, and that may be because of the smaller bone tunnels. The Originally, the use of their uh, own palmaris may have been of a smaller diameter. We're not entirely sure. Um, and also, interestingly, the use of an interference screw during our modification. And I think that several studies have shown that it can be difficult to judge your tensioning with an interference screw. And so while we did try that for a period of time, we've since gone away from it, and we simply use a suture anchor now at the ulnar metaphysis. Age, graft type, that being autograft or allograft, the shape of the sigmoid, so whether it was hypoplastic or not, had no effect on long-term stability or outcome. There were a number of previous procedures all these patients had, with the most common being a previous TFCC repair or debridement. And the results showed that uh, at the six-year follow-up, there were substantial improvements in pronation, supination, and grip strength. And as I said, 90% of these patients were stable. In terms of graft survival, the majority of grafts broke, as you can see here, uh, within the, the first uh, several years of being grafted. And the difference was statistically significant between women having a much uh, higher risk of rupturing their graft long-term than men. However, if we were able to take those patients back to the OR who had ruptured their graft, we were able to restore good motion, we were able to restore stability, and uh, grip, grip strength tended to be uh, stable between a first and secondary surgery. So overall, again, this, this procedure was successful in 86% of patients. And in those patients that had rupture of the graft, it was almost successful in 75% of patients in restoring a pain-free motion following a secondary operation. So this is one of Dick Berger's favorite paintings. It's uh, by Rembrandt, and uh, it's the uh, he always wants to know what's going on in the shadows, uh, this 15% this that doesn't 
work well over a five-year period. And so if we went back and specifically looked at the failures, the reasons were for some of the things you've already heard about. This patient underwent the procedure when clearly this should have been treated with a corrective osteotomy. Uh, Paco has discussed this. Uh, Mark Ross has discussed this. This patient needed a correction of not only the radial height and inclination, but also a translation of that uh, epiphyseal portion ulnarly to stabilize the secondary or to tension the secondary stabilizers. Other cases were missing a concomitant injury that I spoke about in the first lecture, but many of these patients with significant DRUJ injuries will also have a concomitant lunotriclitoral injury, and that is probably due to the fact that they've undergone a reverse perilunate injury pattern where the force enters in through the ulnar aspect of the wrist, comes across the TFCC, but then in, enters into the carpus. So reverse uh, uh, standard perilunate causing SL or LT dissociation first. The signs of standard LT dissociation can be confusing. This would look like a scapolunate dissociation if you just looked at the AP, but by looking at the lateral, you see the VC deformity here. So you know that there's a concomitant LT injury. We've talked about the bayonet deformity that you can see in these patients. And just a patient of mine who I missed this on, this was an MVA, gross instability of the DRUJ, but also, if you look carefully in the OR, this bayonet injury. So he's got a VC, also DRUJ instability. So this patient in the operating room, fortunately, we were able to identify both injuries. And at the time of surgery, using that same approach that I showed you, here's my ulnar head, the lunate and the triquetrum. Here's this tear. This is the actual patient. This is a, a prettier specimen. But this, you can see the tear, all the trauma in here. We can fix both injuries at the same time by using this Berger-Adams procedure and our uh, tenodesis technique that we've described several times in the past by reconstructing the volar and dorsal components of the LT, also using a strip of ECU tendon. And then here's this patient at 24 months with good flexion and extension. You can see stable on his um, AP and lateral views and excellent range of motion here. Other problems that we saw long-term were the creation of uh, arthritis. This was a 47-year-old, uh, uh, two years after reconstruction with the development of pain. When we get a post-operative image, you can see that there's evidence of some bony osteophytes in there. And when we explored him, he did have uh, cartilaginous wear and needed to go on to an arthroplasty. So some of these patients, you'll get to them. And while they don't appear to have arthritis at the time of your ligament reconstruction, I think by tightening up that joint, we can push them towards arthritis. So you have to be very careful in expect, inspecting the seat of that ulnar head to make sure you don't have early arthritic wear because those patients probably would best be served by another operation. So let's go back to our original patient, 15 years old. Again, chronic dislocation. This patient, even after being dislocated for four months, we were able to reduce them. You can see there is a little bit of wear here, but because of her age, we did reconstruct her. And here she is at two years. You can see very stable and very happy and able to return to regular activities. So it's a very successful operation in patients with greater than 85% of the time. I think our failures in this study were due to the use of an interference screw, and I think also not making the proper diagnosis. Those patients that had um, early arthritis or those that needed a corrective osteotomy. I will just also say that there are other options quickly. Dr. Rizzo has talked about the benefits of tightening the interosseous uh, membrane. Uh, Wright and Dell have both talked about the options, which I don't have any experience with, of reconstructing the distal oblique bundle of the interosseous ligament. And recently in the Journal of Hand Surgery, uh, Sarah Lau and uh, Kreiner Woosley have published this paper showing that the stability created by performing this, what I would have to say is probably simpler procedure, was just as good as the uh, Berger Adams procedure. I have no experience with this, but cer certainly something that, that people can look into. Again, fix the bony problem. Um, here's a, a Essex low presti that we fixed. Persistent instability, you can see the dislocation. Once the bony problem is fixed, you can then go in and if you need to, I think this is a good option for, for restoring stability in these patients where you're sure that the bony problem is fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any, uh, you have any issue with the length of the graph there? 
I was reading yeah. one of the papers that said the graph is inadequate. So any comment on that? Yeah, I think that uh, the original technique that you saw, so uh, you come out the bone and then you wrap it completely around the neck of the ulna. When you use the patient's own palmaris, we did find that the graft was often insufficient in length, particularly in uh, women with the shorter forearm. We did uh, switch to allograft after that, but I, I think that since we've modified our technique, and I think Mark will discuss a modification that he's designed, we really haven't had that problem anymore. Okay. Any more questions for Steve? Okay, now we, thank you, Steve. Now we move on to a, a talk by Dr. Mark Henry. He has some different uh, entry points into the radius when they are stabilizing the uh, chronic uh, DRUJ. Steve, uh, Mark, uh, please. I shared the screen, is it, is it showing yes. correctly? Perfect, can you just, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, good enough. Thank you, Pankaj, and the society and all my good friends up there on the panel. It's nice to see so many faces again. Thank you for having me. Uh, my disclaimer is that Steve is a very good friend of mine, and, and please don't <laughs> take any offense to any of the things that are said in this talk. <laughs> so let's talk about really getting the anatomy correct. Everyone has already covered today how the true radial ulnar ligament is the primary stabilizer of the DRUJ. One of the disservices I think that has floated around in our field is talking about a structure, calling it the TFCC, triangle cartilage complex, as if that is one structure. It just isn't. It's a word that refers to multiple independent anatomic structures that yes, blend tissue fibers into each other, and yet there are many distinct individual components. And so I'm going to make a strong point of talking about a true ligament and the histology studies and mostly Toshi Nakamura's studies, who's I think done the best at clarifying this for us. It's a true ligament. Yes, it blends into fibrocartilage tissue. There are contiguous fibers, but we're really interested in the true ligament that comes off of from the fovea and it goes to the margins, the distal margins of the sigmoid notch. Steve Sock covered that patients are into a chronic situation at some point in time from the original traumatic injury, they get past a point that you can simply repair this ligament. This is an intrinsic intraarticular ligament, not entirely unlike the ACL, where the ACL, because it has no blended fibers to neighboring structures, as soon as it ruptures, there's no repair. You're straight to reconstruction, even if it's the day after. RUL is not exactly the same as the ACL. And yes, you can make an acute repair of a ruptured ligament, unlike the ACL, for a certain period of time. At some point on the calendar, that no longer becomes possible because of tissue degeneration, fibers that are no longer under tension, they have to stay under tension to maintain integrity. And so we need a reconstruction at some point. In evaluating the patients, it's really critical to make sure you're making the distinction between true pathologic instability of the DRUJ and simply having recognized a patient who's come into your office who has symptoms. Yes, on examination, you identify physiologic laxity, but their primary problem is not a true pathologic instability of the joint. It's best if you're ultimately going to be surgically reconstructing these patients, if in the history there is a distinct, singularly identifiable trauma event that was the inception of their problem, meaning they truly ruptured a previously intact ligament. Side to side differences, very important in the exam, clarifying the distinction between laxity and instability. And so certainly, even if they are unstable, not everybody needs surgery. Some patients who have lower demand lifestyles and they can be managed by teaching them intentional co-contraction, dynamic stabilization of the joint, ergonomic modifications, and they can avoid surgery. Surgery is going to better fit a high demand user involved in sports or work activities that are placing high forces on this joint and they need to have inherent ligamentous stability. I think one of the questions that still remains unanswered is whether or not a normal user spending a lifetime with an unstable 
DRUJ is necessarily going to progress to a higher rate of osteoarthritis. In orthopedics in general, we expect that you have a joint that's unstable, that it's going to have a faster decline into osteoarthritis, but I just don't think we have the data for this. I'm sure we suspect that's the case, but I've never seen a, a really clear paper on that point. I'm gonna take everybody through the evolution of stabilization. Steve already did this with his slide taken out of an old textbook showing the multiplicity of procedures that were entirely non-anatomic, meaning they were non-anatomic on the ulnar side, they were non-anatomic on the radial side, they were simply tethers. What one of my professors used to refer to as the hot poker technique in a joint, just sear the tissues, scar it down, make it less unstable. But of course that doesn't work because when the user wants to move the joint through a good range of motion or apply high loads and be truly stable, just a bunch of scar tissue doesn't serve that purpose. We did just hear about what I would refer to as a second generation evolution. And indeed it was a fantastic evolution to recognize that you've got to base your reconstruction out of the true fovea. And I think a lot of people who don't operate on the DREJ a lot realize that the fovea is much more radially located than people think. As people follow down the radial margin of the styloid as it starts to curve, I think a lot of people think the fibers originate right at that inflection point and they really don't. They actually originate just ulnar to the hyaline cartilage. As soon as you get off the hyaline cartilage of the ulnar seat, that's where the fibers are coming up and Toshi Nakamura's studies show that very clearly. And so that is actually much further radial than people think. And that's where your tunnels need to come out is at that point, not really at the cusp of the base of the styloid, which is too far ulnar. Nevertheless, great advance to become anatomic, the ulnar fovea. Unfortunately, it is simply not possible for a sagittal plane tunnel hidden with inside the concavities of the lunate fossa, inside the concavity of the sigmoid notch, is not the anatomic location of these fibers on the radius. It's not. And grafts that come out of the fovea and go to such a sagittal tunnel are taking a non-anatomic pathway of a proximal descent that makes them go around the margins of the ulnar head and is simply not possible to really recreate the dual functions of both allowing full motion while getting true stability at the same time. And that's why you're gonna see graft ruptures and promotion of arthritis. Either excess of constraint driving the hyaline surfaces against each other or causing a rupture to happen when the patient tries to go through a fully loaded range of motion, excess strain in a graft that's not anatomic. And so really, as in so many other joints in the body, and often when I try to explain this to patients, use the ACL as an example, you have to get it anatomically correct. And so modern generation, you want to have both the ulna and the radial side be the true anatomic attachment points of the original radial ulna ligament. It's bad enough that we're working with tendon because tendon is not the same as ligament. Studies will show there's a tenfold difference in elasticity between ligament fibers and tendon fibers. Referencing our sports colleagues again, there are studies that show with tendon-based grafts in the ACL that there is a ligamentization process over time and histology samples show a change in the elastin content of the fibers remodeled over time this may or may not be true for the RUL. I haven't seen studies that show ligamentization repeat biopsies for RUL reconstructions. I don't believe those have been done to my knowledge, but we can extrapolate from our colleagues because there's such a high number of ACL reconstructions happening that this is likely going to happen to a true intraarticular ligament, which is what the RUL is, much like that ACL. There was a good study from 05 from Gofton where in the laboratory, they took a look at the second generation, which is not anatomic radius versus third generation anatomic at radius. And they showed clearly in the lab testing that you simply cannot restore the true stability with that second generation technique, but you can restore it equal to a native RUL as long as all of your attachment points are exactly where the true RUL used to attach. So that's the reconstruction that we're gonna talk about today. 
Steve's already gone over. I won't rehash some of the results from the technique, the second generation technique. One of the things it does though, is if you make it tight enough that they're not unstable, you're going to restrict motion because you're creating a non-physiologic, non-anatomic constraint. And this was also shown in some of the other studies by other authors. And we're not using PROMs in those studies. And that's going to, at the end of my talk, I'll show you, be very important because it's hard to use the other objective measures to really say whether it's working or isn't. And one of the more recent studies, except for the one Steve just showed, came out in 16 from Hess. And you should find they actually got quite poor results uh, using that second generation technique, a lot of residual laxity, limited motion, and they actually did use patient rated outcome measures. They use a PRWE, which has been shown to be the best outcome measure for the wrist and had extremely high scores with higher being worse, of course. This is our study that was published in, a, in 2012 had mostly male patients. We excluded bony pathologies. They'd had extensive pre-surgical workup. They're all very unstable on exam, comparative, contralateral, all three positions, supination, pronation, and neutral, comparing both amplitude and endpoint back and forth between the two sides, standard for physical examination. MRIs did support a complete rupture through the fovea. We first did arthroscopy. Jeff Ecker, very nice talk on arthroscopy, wonderful talk he gave. I would also reference for those of you, uh, Paco's books. I have a chapter in the ulnar wrist sided book, which talks about using a true directly opposing volar portal below the disc into the DRUJ, similar, not the same, but similar to the portal that Dr. Ecker showed where you can really manipulate and examine the foveal origin and verify intact or not. And it was so great to hear him debunking the hook test as not being representative of a foveal tear of the RUL. That was really great to see that work he did. And this is important. The examination, everyone else has covered that well. We don't need to do that. This is an example of what I was talking about. The true, you can see that that's a directly opposing portal. You make it inside out. You start with your dorsal portal below the disc. You exit specifically ulnar to the FCU. So you're going to be coming out in between the mixed ulnar nerve and the dorsal branch ulnar nerve. Those are the wrists that will scare people who are not regular arthroscopists. And so you're truly directly opposite. You're operating in your visualizing instruments there and you can clearly test for that. And that's in Paco's book. Three incisions for doing this operation. The main working incision is a mid axial incision approaching where you're gonna make all of your drills through this incision. Critical here and Dr. Kakar talked about this but I would differ very importantly in one thing you don't want to touch the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve at all. You don't want to handle it or touch it. You don't want to put a loop around it. You don't want to pull on it. You don't want to retract it. Doing that is enough to give patients significant pain afterwards. The entire operation transpires both proximal and dorsal to the nerve. You do not want to be operating volar to that branch. That branch simply shifts and mobilizes away volar and distal, and you're doing all of your operation proximal and dorsal to it. Steve referenced uh, some midterm techniques we're using with this. Currently, we actually make two distinct drill tunnels in the ulna because what that does, it gets the tunnel coming out of the ulna pointing exactly at where the graft is going to go to its attachment on the radial side. So from the ulna, we make one tunnel that goes proximal and volar and exits to the fovea and that limb of the graft going through that tunnel is then going to join to the dorsal distal margin of the sigmoid notch, make a second tunnel converging at the fovea with the first tunnel that comes from more distal and dorsal. And the limb of the graft going through there is going to be pointing as it exits the fovea straight on its pathway to the volar distal margin of the sigmoid notch. And so we'll take a palmaris graft 
and these are just description of the tunnels, take a polymeris graft out, and then you're gonna run it through the two ulna tunnels, and you'll have the two different limbs that will then come out. You put traction sutures on those. Now, I'm gonna go back a couple of slides here. The, diff, the technical difficulty of really getting it anatomically correct is making your drill tunnels entering at the absolute margins of the sigmoid notch at precisely where the original fibers of the ligament insert. So you're at the absolute distal margin of the sigmoid notch at the far volar edge and the far dorsal edge. And so you can see where the drills will go into those and they will then exit on the far radial margin at the brachioradialis footprint. And so you want your two tunnels coming out at the brachioradialis footprint. These are technically difficult to make. What we actually do is we make the first pass with a four or five K wire to make absolutely certain we have the tunnel exactly where we want it. We'll image that to be certain it's right at the margin that we didn't misinterpret by looking through the wound. You can actually use some dry arthroscopy technique if you want. You simply put a scope in through the wound because you have a bright light and a magnified view and make certain that the K wire is entering where you want it to. And then we over drill it with a 2.8 drill bit from the Acumed AccuTrack set and then upsize that to a 2.9 and that gives you an appropriately sized tunnel for the Palmaris graft. And so then you can see now in the screenshot on the upper right, we've got Houston suture passers entering through that brachial radialis footprint with a small counter incision over there on the radial side of the wrist. The passer is going to come out only through the tunnels at the margin of the sigmoid notch, go down to that lower left screen. You can see how you can capture the two tails there on the Houston's and you pull them back through to the lower right screen and see them coming out. Now, someone commented about length of graph. Palmaris will give you more graph length than you need. And as you can see at the first pass, we've got plenty of graph coming back out the radial side. Obviously that's not how you're gonna leave it. So what you'll do is we'll pull one limb, we'll draw back until you're just inside the exit point of the tunnel with the other limb, mark the longer limb, bring it back out, cut it down short and re-anchor. And now when you're fully tightened on your reconstruction, the tissue is gonna just approximate where it's about to exit the margin of the radius. And then you can use your sutures to tie over the bony bridge on top of the breaker at footprint on the radial side for very secure. And that's where you tie down. Now back at the ulnar side, what we will do in the long ulnar tunnel is simply put an interference screw in. What that does is prevent any slippage or sliding of the graft in the ulna, but the definitive fixation is accomplished on the radial side. We will reduce the joint before tightening it down and actually pin the radial ulnar relationship with 62 k wires proximal to the DIUJ for four weeks. So they'll be in a sugar tong with the pins in for four weeks take out the pins at that point because they are starting to heal in the graft already. And we want a little bit of tension in the limbs because we know that tensile loading in tissue is important for healing. If you unload it fully, it won't heal well. So we get the pins out at that time, continue into a standard cast for two additional weeks and then start full range of motion around six weeks. We start light strengthening eight weeks and onwards to higher from there. So in our study, Everyone was able to return to original work and recreational activities, all tested stable to exam. And here's why objective measures don't really tell the story. If you look, the left column numbers is pre-op, the right's post-op. So the patients actually increase their range of motion a little bit, but it's not because the underlying condition restrained motion. The lower numbers pre-op are simply from pain and guarding. There's nothing about having an unstable DRUJ that actually stops you from moving. And so when we solved their symptoms, they were simply willing to move in their normal range. Now for those looking at the supination pronation numbers saying, hey, those look a little bit low, compared to some other studies, it's because we're actually measuring the true rotation at the forearm level. We're not including carpal supination and pronation. Most people, when they measure and report forearm rotation are actually measuring off the hand and that's excessively high ranges because they're including carpal supination as well. But if you measure straight across the axis of the DRUJ, it's a little bit less. So these are normal ranges for these patients. They're equal to the contralateral side and using a patient rated outcome measure, I think is going to be 
the most important aspect of evaluating DRUJ reconstructions because it's the user appreciation of the ability to go out and live life and do the things they want to do, which is the whole reason they're coming to us in the first place. So these people, after five months of the best efforts non-surgically, had a mean dash of 62 pre-op. They were very disabled by their unstable wrist, not able to do what they wanted to do, post-op seven. So they went from 62 to seven with the reconstruction. So we sought very specifically for a variety of complications to see if they were producing them, did not at all, thankfully, and very important, I would say, do not even touch the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve. In conclusion, we'd say that not everyone who's unstable necessarily needs surgery. Are, are we going to see progression of osteoarthritis if we leave people unstable over several decades? I don't think we know that yet. It'll be interesting to see. Unfortunately, really all of our literature, my paper and, and others is level four evidence. It's going to be difficult to organize higher level studies. I think we'll need that ultimately before we can answer some of these questions better. What are some of the research problems of that? Stability is something that is best judged because it's dynamic on an exam, but we still don't really have a uniform set of criteria that can level the examination results across all researchers, all centers, so we can com communicate effectively on this. I thought it was really fantastic, the special jig Steve's created at Mail. I thought that was awesome to get dynamic imaging, really fantastic because static unloaded imaging just doesn't tell a story about stability. All it does is show how the body sits when statically imaged and it can show anatomic discontinuity of dark fibers, but it doesn't show response. That jig is really fantastic. Look forward to future studies coming from that. But as we said, measuring range of motion and grip strength, they're just not that helpful for DRUJ instability, because they're not that corrupted to begin with. It's really not a measure of if we're helping these people. So I think the PROMs are going to be important. And the PRUWE, I think, is the best. We use the DASH simply because it's what most other studies have. So it would be more comparable. But I think the PRUWE is actually better. I would have done better with my study if I'd used that instead. And so that's all I have to say. And I thank everybody for listening. Uh, Mark, uh, you mentioned about people who have a uh, low demand. You offer them uh, ergonomic activity modification and dynamic stabilization. Uh, you want to comment on that? What exactly you do there? there? There's really no great complexity to it. It's a matter of teaching them that when they're going to bear greater loads and the therapist will teach them how to use their antagonist antagonist groups to stabilize the wrist dynamically through intentional co-contraction creates some added degree of stability and then teach the patients to stay out of loading in end range to stay mid range and neutral. Of course, that requires limiting how you use your wrist, but if they're a low demand user and they can carry in the grocery bags and push open heavy doors and lift up objects with that, and they're not trying to do complicated sports, they're not playing tennis, they're not doing other things, they can be satisfied enough. And so if we don't know that they're going to necessarily progress to arthritis and the patient's happy, I think it's fine to leave them with that. It's all about what satisfies the patient. And so with proper training, there's a certain amount of low demand users say, look, I'm satisfied. I really don't want to be cut. Doctor, unless you can convince me that I'm going to progress downhill into arthritis, I really don't want surgery. I don't think we have the evidence to try to talk these people into surgery if they say they're happy enough with what we can teach them in therapy. But if the patient has come to you, obviously he has pain. So won't you offer something? Uh, well, uh, certainly the then, patients, uh, if we've uh, trained them the best the we can and they say, look, I still hurt uh, too much trying to live my life. Well, then they're going to have to consider doing a stabilization surgery provided of course that okay. we're certain that the reason for the pain is the instability and all the wonderful talks we've heard today pointing out time and again, how you have to be certain of why is your patient hurting? All right, okay. Any comment from Jeff? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a wonderful talk, Mark. Um, 
it just highlights that, that there is a window where we do have problems with these patients. I, I couldn't agree more. It's a patient choice. Um, and they make the choice. There's no evidence they get arthritic. Uh, you know, I, and we've all seen people have got gross instability that are pain free. So what I do is I listen to them if they're complaining of pain, well, we listen. We do these, these evaluations with pronation, supination, and force plate, and we look at their symptoms, and the patient makes the choice. And often when they see how weak they are, because there's a different thing, some people accommodate and restrict their life. And when you test them and they see the problems they're having, it can change their perception as well. So I think surgery is a wonderful thing when it's indicated the risk-benefit ratio is there. And I'd agree completely with Mark. And uh, there's this one thing we haven't talked about. It's the static subluxation, dislocation of the DAUJ. Steve Moran hit on, on that quite well. I think that's a different beast that can give us a lot of trouble. Gabor, you want to add something there? Because that has been extremely important talk here. No more questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Steve, are you there? Yes, yes. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, you want to add something there? No, I think, you know, I think Mark Stocks is amazing. I think that I, I would agree with him that obviously trying, like ACL repair, the closer you can get to uh, the anatomical insertion of those ligaments, it probably would prevent uh, rupture and, and some of the other problems that we saw. Um, and, you know, obviously, I, I also agree if the patient's asymptomatic, you would never offer this operation to them. Okay. Uh, Mark, do you do other procedures other than this stabilization procedure like uh, dorsal capsular uh, tightening to which uh, Robert was referring to or uh, DOB uh, reconstruction? I don't because those aren't the primary stabilizers. Recreating connection exactly and precisely at the main stabilizer joint is absolutely your best way to render this joint stable. And so, yes, you can do these other things, but it's not reproducing the primary stabilizer. So if you can reproduce it, there's no reason to use a procedure that is less anatomic than what this joint depends on for its inherent stability. So right. I, I okay. understand that they exist, but I suspect that it's primarily because they're technically easier to do. I, I, I will admit that hitting those targets precisely is fairly technically difficult. You need to be a regular DRUJ surgeon and wrist surgeon to do that, but it's something that definitely can be learned uh, and devote yourself to doing that. And then you can do a truly anatomic procedure, which in the history of orthopedics has always proven to be best for joint stabilization, no matter what joint you look at, shoulder, knee, take your pick. Once we get most anatomic, that's when we get our best results. All right. Okay. Uh, can we have, I think uh, I can add on these uh, other procedures if it's okay with you. Uh, can I please? Let me look out. I think. Need to try. Okay, uh, can you see my slide, Ravi? Sir, it's visible. Okay, fine. Uh, there are other procedures which are available and I had a chance to read them and we have been doing some of these procedures to which, about which we just talked. And two of them are, one is extensor retinaculum advancement, another is a capsular tightening here. Ultimately, the aim is to restore a painless range of motion and the patient should be able to get back to work. And of course, we talked about uh, Adams Berger procedure, which has been the benchmark. Uh, the modification that Mark just mentioned. Then there are other procedures, and we are going to talk about extensor retinoculum advancement here. And the scheme of the procedure is you identify the extensor retinoculum and the fourth extensor compartment here. You reflect the extensor retinoculum, you bring it. Under the fourth compartment here, the extensor retinoculum has been brought subjacent here. 
and then you make two drill holes on the radial uh, on the radius on the dorsal ulnar call uh, corner here one on this side and one on other side and you combine these two holes here and then you push the ulna volar ward and suture the extensor retinaculum at the ulnar dorsal column here does it work oh yes the pain goes away some laxity persists has it been done in the past yes a herbal procedure was done but that was not extensor retinaculum alone it was Pankha scapular retinaculum yes sorry to interrupt actually your slides are not moving okay can you see that you are sharing a different screen you are sharing a you are sharing a different screen i think yeah just a minute can you see now yeah 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 it's visible now sir please okay okay can you see now yeah it's okay sir okay now this has been done in the past this was called a herbert uh, procedure what that was done was the extensor retinaculum was cut at the dotted line advance more radially here so that it cause some stabilization of the ulna here the procedure that we have been doing quite often here here has been described in journal of bone and joint surgery by ravi gupta here and this basically means what was just shown here a uh, ulnar base flap of extensor retinaculum was raised and through two converging holes this was sutured after uh, reducing the ulna here it has been described by other authors as well here and this came from louisville kentucky where t sunil described a similar procedure here using an extensor retinaculum together with the dorsal capsule here and this has really stabilized the joint a combination of extensor retinaculum with capsule was described earlier from a paper coming from netherland here and also it stabilized and the pain went away here and they had a study of about 38 patients using dorsal stabilization here and they also thought it's a less invasive procedure here and they preferred it as a first option here and what they did was there was a reflection of the extensor retinaculum there was a, a dissection of the capsule and they were both advanced on either side the capsule was advanced on other side the retinaculum was advanced on other side and this caused the stabilization of the dorsally subluxating ulna here so this is the clinical example here this was a uh, unstable ulna here this was the radial stylet ulna stylet dorsal tubercle here a dorsal incision here we dissected out a tongue of extensor retinaculum here which is based on the ulnar side here the extensor digitorum communis tendons were reflected on to the radial side and we made two holes as mentioned here and we combined these two holes and using number 2 ethy bond here this extensor retinaculum was sutured after reducing the ulna here procedure appears to be too simple but it works the pain goes away laxity persists but patient is not really aware of this thing unless patient's ulna is moved back and forth the patient not even aware about this laxity here but this appears too simple the extensor retinaculum is too fragile appearing and therefore we thought probably it's going to give way and therefore we added a dorsal capsule to it to which robert was alluding to here and what we did to this extent the dorsal capsule is tightened here and this is sutured by double breasting the extensor uh, the double breasting the dorsal capsule here we called up two patients the other a few weeks back and this is the kind of pronation supination patient had and the patient is now pursuing the post graduation in surgery here she we called up do you have any pain and she said she is not even aware of the surgery except the surgical scar here this is the second patient who had almost similar uh, strength and pinch strength here and the reasonable range of motion so these are two additional procedure that we have been doing extensor retinaculum advancement and uh, reinforcing with dorsal capsular imbrication and they have really uh, helped these patient and uh, this were two year follow up that i have just presented of at least two patient that we were able to trace in this covid time share So an observation pain disappears laxity persists but patient is happy
So whether it is a sensor retinaculum alone that works, or the added dorsal capsule that works, this we are going to learn over a period of time. But these procedures have really helped alleviate the pain in these patients. We talked about uh, uh, Louis Shaker earlier. This is one of the photograph of Louis Shaker. We were we were doing fellowship with him. This is birthday celebration here in Louisville in '88. Uh, in summary, a dorsal capsular imbrication with or without extensive retinaculum tightening works. It restores painful, pain-free range of motion, and in chronic instability with no arthritis, it really has helped in uh, in this uh, by doing these simple procedures. I thank you very much. Any question to me? If not, then we will, we on we go on to the next talk, which is by Professor Gebor Zali, and he is from uh, Germany, and he is going to tell us about salvage procedure and ulna shortening here. Professor Gebor, please. Just a second. Professor Gebor, yeah, you're coming. Yeah, sorry. So, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you and you are visible. Okay, also. then I start. So, ulna shortening osteotomy. So, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to talk and I have been in India now for five times and I'm coming from Germany, exactly in the middle of Germany and most of you are sitting here in India. So, ulna shortening osteotomy. When I got this topic, I thought, what a simple lecture take home message, just make it two millimeters shorter and ready we are. Thank you very much and bye bye. But <laughs> stop, there are some questions left. So it is really so simple. Um, the question is, ulna shortening or perhaps arthroscopic wafer resection for ulna impaction syndrome. The next question is the comparison of clinical outcomes after ulna shortening osteotomy for ulna impaction syndrome with or without um, debridement. The next question is, do we need an expensive dynamic compression plate for ulna shortening osteotomy? And the next thing is, do we have to treat the TFCC lesion? So the question is for this talk, every one treatment for every stage, every age, with or without TFCC, debridement, yes or no, ulna shortening or better wafer resection. What are we doing with the arthrosis of the ulna head? And is it better the ulna shortening osteotomy or perhaps a salvage procedure? So what a simple lecture, absolutely not. Um, it is not so easy that we make it two millimeters shorter. Okay, we start. So those are the patients in our outpatients clinic. Um, every second patient has this ulna-sided wrist pain. That is the reason why it is so important to talk um, or to perform such a big webinar. Before we start to talk about the ulna shortening, you have to know that there are three different types of distal radius ulna joints. Somebody before already mentioned it, type one, type two, and type three. So you have to look for the angle of the distal radius ulna joint. Um, here is a typical type one distal radius ulna joint and on the right side, uh, type three. The ulna variance is also very important and the red line is the ulna variance on the left side an ulna positive variance and on the right side, uh, ulna negative variance. And it is very, very important to, to differentiate the ulna impaction syndrome and the Keenbox uh, box disease. A lot of people are coming and they say, oh, I have a Keenbox disease and all they have is an ulna impaction syndrome. And somebody already mentioned it before, always when you see here, the lunate lightening on the ulna side, it is in most cases not a Keenbox disease, it is an ulna impaction syndrome. In case of doubt, I perform the dynamic grip view, and then you see that um, you have a positive ulna variance and also a problem of the scapulonate ligament. The next question is, do we need really the arthroscopy before the ulna shortening osteotomy? From my point, it is absolutely important to know what is going on in the joint. So just one example here, 
a typical Palmer 1A lesion, so an acute traumatic tear here. And this is a Palmer 2A lesion. That means that the lunate is intact, but this isn't uh, acute trauma. This is an old trauma of the TFCC. If you have a cartilage defect of the of the lunate, so we have a Palmer 2C lesion. So it is from my point of view very important to differentiate this here. Once again, a big defect here of the TFCC, but the ulnar head is looking good. There is no cartilage defect. But if you have here also a big defect of the TFCC and also a cartilage defect of the ulnar head and of the lunate, yeah. So this is very important to know from my point of view before the ulnar shortening osteotomy. Here, uh, also a big cartilage defect of the, of the uh, lunate. Here, this is the TFCC. The ulnar head is looking terrible. And I will talk about this case later. The next question is which plate and how do we really need an uh, expensive plate? Here, in this case, I did the arthroscopy before and I made the ulnar shortening osteotomy in this way. This is a reconstruction plate at 3.5 millimeters, and I can't recommend this plate because in a lot of cases we saw uh, pseudoarthrosis or um, a broken plate. So from my point of view, the reconstruction plate is not stable enough. The next example is, um, do we need the expensive dynamic compression plate? I just show you um, one example here. Once again, the um, TFCC defect, the ulnar head, and here the lunate. So this is a typical ulnar infection syndrome here, ulnar plus variants here, the lunate. And in this case, um, the dynamic compression plate. And this is going like this. In this case, uh, Vola approach, and then the ulna, and then the advice for shortening the ulna. You can do it in 45 degrees, or if you want, in 90 degrees. So really very smart, very easy. And then you take out two or three millimeters. You can measure it here. You can take out up to eight millimeters, and then you make the ulna shorter as you like. But I just show you how I do it. So this was the plate from MedArtis, which is in Germany, much more expensive than all the other plates. I already told you not to take the 3.5 plate. I now show you how I do the ulnar shortening osteotomy. I make the same approach. You can take the Wola approach or the dorsal approach. Here then I make the osteotomy of two millimeters and then I cut the bone like this, like a step. I take out two or three millimeters and then I take the piece of bone on both sides out and then I make the ulna shorter. Here, some photos you see here that I take out the two millimeters of the bone, a little bit bigger for everybody. And then here on the other side also two millimeters here and two millimeters there, and here the two centimeter osteotomy. And then that is looking like this. And just put them together. Then I put three little screws inside to fix it. And then a 4.5 um, angle stable locking plate, not a 3.5, and then it is looking like this. Much more cheaper, stable, and because of the big um, distance of the bone, which is coming together, um, I nearly never saw pseudarthrosis and I never saw broken plate because of the uh, 4.5 uh, millimeter plate. This is a picture I saw in one of the last webinars, the osteotomy of the ulna head and then um, take out a piece of bone, making it shorter and fix it with two Herbert screws. This is also possible, but you have to look that the TFCC is not intact. So I wouldn't and never would do this if the TFCC is intact. 
The next question is um, ulna shortening or vapor resection. Just to show how it is working. Here, once again, a big defect of the TFCC, the ulna head is with the cartilage defect here in a draft. It is very important that you take everything out. So don't leave here um, bone on both sides. So it, it's very important not to take just out the interior of the ulna head. You have to take everything away. And then that is looking like this. Here you need the burr. So once again, this example here, the cartilage defect of the lunate, the ulna head, the TFCC, and then the burr is coming and it takes some time and you take step by step the ulna head away. Once again, the draft and like this, it is looking after the ulna shortening osteotomy and after the vapor resection of the ulna head. In this case, I already said this is a type three of the distal radius ulnar joint, ulnar shortening osteotomy or better vapor resection. Or in this case, I performed a Bowers procedure, also arthroscopic with the burr. You can do it also open. But here in this um, problem, I would go for a Bowers procedure or any salvage procedure, but um, not for the ulnar shortening osteotomy. So I will talk about the results. As I said in the beginning, dynamic compression plate or normal plate. So if you do the ulnar shortening osteotomy, the wrist flexion and extension is always a little bit um, worse than on the contralateral side. And also forearm pronation and supination is also a little bit worse than on the contralateral side. Here they took out 2.2 millimeters, but the pain and the death score was absolutely better. In comparison to other studies, you see here the non-union rate in case of ulna shortening osteotomy is always somehow between zero and 11%. And the plate removal um, up to 33% uh, 30, uh, and the flexion um, of the wrist is in all the studies between 60 and 70%, also the extension between around about 60 and 70%, and pro and supination also between 70 and around about 80%, and the grip strength is between 20 and 31%. And you have excellent and good results in around about 80% after, after ulnar shortening osteotomies in all those um, publications. The question is now, the next one is outcome analysis of ulnar shortening osteotomy for ulnar impaction syndrome. And here also the range of motion 10 degree worse than on the opposite side. Pain is better, dash is better, but smokers have the worse result. What about the comparison um, uh, compression of clinical outcomes after ulnar shortening osteotomy for ulnar impaction syndrome with or without arthroscopic debridement. And here it is like this, that in this study, it doesn't matter if you do the ulnar shortening osteotomy alone or with arthroscopic debridement, the pain and the death go nearly the same. The same is here, the comparison after three and 12 months and ulnar shortening osteotomy alone or ulnar shortening osteotomy with arthroscopic debridement after 12 months, nearly the same results. So ulnar shortening or arthroscopic vapor resection, what should we do? So about more than 80% are very satisfied whether you do the ulnar shortening or the arthroscopic ulnar head resection. The pseudoarthrosis rate is in all the studies around about 10%, 0% in the uh, ulnar head resection. But pay attention, the uh, risk of secondary, secondary arthrosis of the distal radius ulnar joint is in case of the ulnar shortening osteotomy 
much more higher. So in younger patients, you should go for the um, ulnar shortening and older patients more uh, for the ulnar head resection. Heart remo removal is necessary or was performed in about 30% and the costs of the ulnar shortening are higher. The operation time is about 20 minutes longer in case of the ulnar shortening in comparison to the ulnar heart resection, but the TFCC should have a lesion if you go for the ulnar head resection. If you want to take more than two millimeters, you should go um, better for the ulnar shortening osteotomy. If you uh, want to take away less, less than two millimeters and you have a TFCC lesion, you can go for the ulnar head resection. The post-operative load is possible just after consolidation in case of the ulnar shortening and immediately after ulnar head resection, but you need some experience um, if you want to go for the ulnar head resection. Round about the same is the dash and the same. The patients are going a little bit earlier back to work after the arthroscopic head resection. So you see I'm talking a little bit fast because we are running out of time. In the beginning I, beginning, I started with the question, ulnar shortening osteotomy, what a simple lecture. Absolutely not. So um, it is not like this that you just take uh, out two millimeters and then ready we are. Um, it is, uh, you have to think about some things, but it is a very, very satisfying procedure, but you should know some things, as I told you, about the arthroscopic head resection and the plates. Thank you very much. Okay, any question for Professor Gebor? If none, then we, we'll have some question and answer after his presentation. Uh, we'll have, uh, he's going to talk about salvage procedures and distal radial in a joint. Professor Gabor again. Yeah, just a second. Oh, I do yeah, this. please. Yeah, I just have to go for my. I'm coming. Mm hmm. So I'm coming. I hope you can still hear me. Yes. You are audible, I... sir. Please go ahead. Okay, I go on. So salvage procedures of the distal radius ulnar joint. We have heard a lot about the distal radius ulnar joint today. All the pos possibilities to repair it and to look for the instability. And I'm talking now about the problems and the cases when it doesn't work and if when you have to think about the salvage procedures. So the first thing you should settle is, do you want to salvage yourself or the patient? This is the first thing you have to think about. And possible causes for arthrosis are, for example, fracture in 19% of distal radius fractures, galaxy fracture, fracture or SX lopresti lesions, um, isolated radio ulnar dissociation, deformity, or rheumatism. All those are reasons for or possible possibilities for arthrosis of the distal radius ulnar joint. So I will come to this case later, 44 year old man, one year after the uh, this radius fracture and the volar plate osteosynthesis, an older picture, you see it, um, those plates a um, uh, long time ago. But then you do the CT scan and you see the atrosis of the distal radius ulnar joint. So the question now is what to do? Which options do we have in such a case? So the first thing you have to think about is not the salvage procedure. The first thing you always have to think about is the correction osteotomy. We already heard about this a lot of times today. Perhaps you know this um, lady, the house of God, Samuel Shemin, 1978, 
uh, called this woman the LOL in NAD, the little old lady in no apparent distress. And we have a lot of those patients in our outpatient clinic. So what to do if a lady, a LOL in NAD is coming to your outpatient's clinic with such a picture. You see the situation after this radius fracture and the question how is salvage procedure or um, correction and for sure you have to do the correction osteotomy. In this special case, you should take out the plate as early as possible because um, she will get a problem with her flexion, uh, uh, flexor tendons. The next thing is, is it worth the effort if you have the next patient in your outpatient's clinic and you ask yourself again, correction or salvage procedure, and it is absolutely worth to do all the effort. And you see here after the correction osteotomy, we have such a picture. So never go directly to the salvage procedure think about the correction osteotomy and only when you are sure that it is not possible to correct, then you should think about the salvage procedure. So which options do we have? So the easiest salvage procedure is the denervation. And you see here, the most patients had book Ramco, German hand surgeon, and nine, he published 195 patients and Round about 60 to 90% are very good or good, and just 11 to round about 40% better or the same. So this is the easiest salvage procedure. The patient can need no, no cast or anything. And the next salvage procedure you should think about is I already uh, told you is the Bowers procedure. You can do it arthroscopic, like here or um, open, and it is a hemi-resection of the distal ulna. The same here, the atrosis of the distal radius ulna joint and the hemi-resection of the uh, distal ulna. The results, if you look for some publications, are pro and supinations nearly normal, 80 to 90 percent, the grip strength about um, 60 to 80% to the opposite side, but pain is better. And just in a few cases, instability. A German hand surgeon and a friend of mine, Professor van Schoenhofen, only he published 16 from 31 patients with the instability. The other publications said no instability or just one patient with instability. If you look for the results after the Bowers procedure, um, they say improve the range of forearm rotation, pain is reduced, grip strength is better, instability may result, the satisfaction is high and the results are good or very good. The next option I like also very much like the Bowers procedure is the Soveka Panchi procedure here. I always take out about one, one and a half centimeters and I put the bone here in between the radius and the ulna and fix it with two um, screws. If you look to the literature, it says exactly the same, improve the range of forearm rotation, pain is reduced, power is better, instability may result, and the patient's satisfaction is high and the functional results are good. Um, Mark Henry already said, spoke about the DARA procedure. It is the resection of the um, distal ulna here, the atrosis of the distal radius um, ulna joint. It's, so in comparison to the Bowers procedure, you take everything away. And if you look, and then um, I think those patients after the Dauer procedure complain more about instability. If you are in doubt, you can perform the power grip view. But if you look to the literature, they say exactly the same, improve the range of forearm rotation, pain is reduced, power is better, instability may result, and the patient's satisfaction is high and the results are good. So the literature doesn't help us. Um, if you wonder here, what is the best um, salvage procedure? The next possibility for a salvage procedure of the distal radius ulna joint is the ulna head prosthesis. I, also like very much. And here the patient I 
showed you in the beginning, atrosis of the distal radius ulna joint after plate osteosynthesis of the distal radius. The CT scan shows you a complete destruction of the distal radius ulna joint. And it is a really very, very simple procedure. You use the dorsal approach, you pay attention to the ulnar nerve, then you um, put the tendons by side, you open the capsule, you take about one, one and a half centimeters of the ulna head away. Here, this is the CT scan and here the ulna head. And then you put press fit the prosthesis inside, no cement is necessary. And then on the left side, six weeks after surgery and on the right side, two years after surgery. Free range of motion two years after the surgery, no pain, and the uh, grip strength 40 kilos on both sides. And a publication again from Jörg van Schomhofen from Germany, the range of motion is higher, the grip strength is higher, and the pain is less. So now here a special case. I did uh, about one year ago, 80 year old, um, woman situation after four corner fusion, and you see the problem of the distal radius ulnar joint. You see the ulnar impaction syndrome. You see here a problem between ulnar uh, radius and lunate. You see, um, perhaps I don't know if it was completely consolidated. You see a CMC atrosis, and you see here the subluxation of um, the carpus to the volar side. The question now here is what to do, to do it in one stage or in several surgeries. So what I did in this special case, I started with the arthroscopy. I uh, went on with the denervation. Then I did the arthrodesis of the wrist. I made an implant removal because we thought it's disturbing. Then I put the ulnar head prosthesis inside I made the trapezectomy because of the CMC arthrosis. And at the end, I made a tenolysis. And the question now, how it is going, this uh, lady after two, four, six, seven surgeries, and she is speaking now German, but I will translate. She's absolutely free of pain. The fingers are moving. The wrist is be after the arthrodesis is stiff. Pro and supination is nearly free, and um, she's absolutely free of pain and very satisfied. The next example here after the ulna head prosthesis, one year you see here the loosening of the prosthesis, but in most cases, cases the X-ray is looking worse than the clinical result is. If you look to the literature after the joint arthroplasty. It says that the um, ulnar head prosthesis have a good potential to improve function through pain reduction. Instability is not uncommon, but with the ulnar head only implants, um, they cause fewer clinical problems and the re-interventions then might be expected. The risk of a deep infection is small and the survival after five years is up to 95 percent and what is very important, the osteolysis of the prosthesis um, is frequently reported, but it causes its causes and consequences are not really clarified. So this is one example I did after um, instability, so Vika Panji, um, and the man had the instability of the distal ulna, and the question was now what to do. And um, I put a special ulnar head prosthesis inside. And you see about two years after the primary surgery, you see here that the distance is getting less and less. And I think the screw has contact to the um, ulnar head or to the prosthesis. You see here, there are already two millimeters. And here there's already contact between uh, the screw and the prosthesis. The last thing I just want to mention is the Checker ulnar head arthroplasty. 
a very expensive prosthesis and I know just a handful of hand surgeons in Germ Germany who does it and most of the insurance doesn't pay this procedure. But I just want to mention it that it exists. And you see here a case after instability after Anna had prosthesis and we put a Shecker prosthesis inside to stabilize the um, distal radius ulnar joint. So my take home message for the salvage procedures is that you think first, think about the correction osteotomy. There isn't one option for everybody. You should know all the options. I told you the denervation, correction osteotomy, all the salvage, salvage procedures, Darach Bauer, Sloveka Panchi, and the prosthesis and also the special prosthesis. And you should find out, out um, the individual solution for each of your patients. Here once again, my case, and thank you very much for listening to me. Sorry that I was talking so fast, but we were running out of time. Thank you, Professor Gebor. Uh, that was just amazing. Uh, any question for Professor Gebor? I have a question for all the faculty. My question is, everywhere we read, everywhere we read, we are repairing TFCC. TFCC consists of half a dozen things. What we are actually repairing is just ligamentum subcruentum. Am I wrong? Uh, Professor Jeff, to start with. Um, I don't think that anybody is wrong in this world, um, but your point is accurate. There are so many things going on in the DAUJ. Um, we are ignorant about the dorsal soft tissues, which we've talked about today, where the, 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 the actual TFCC strips away. We are ignorant about the ECU, what constitutes pathological abnormalities in the ECU? We don't talk about proportional concavity, which is a normal behavior of the ECU. And what I would stress is the most important thing is to listen to the patient, examine them and get all the information and then act with the information, knowing what end result you are going to get. Now, you know, Toshi Nakamura says it doesn't really matter what technique you use as long as you fix it and as long as it's anatomically specific. So um, with the arthroscope, we can see the anatomy and we can do anatomically specific repairs. And I don't wanna go into arguing what's already been said today, but it's really clear to me that most of them you can fix. Most of them you can fix arthroscopically, very simply, very few need foveal repairs. Mostly the food that do need it need a tendon graft and you need to look at the whole picture. And it's the ones that fail where we all need to collaborate and learn. So uh, th that's my thought. And I think if you, uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's just the gray ones that don't work that we've got to work out. Mark, uh, you want to comment on that? We are not repairing TFCC. What we are repairing is a ligament of subcruentum. Uh, your thoughts on that? Is the, is the terminology that being used, we are repairing TFCC inappropriate? What we are repairing is ligamentum subcruentum. Your comment, please. Yeah, Mark, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. I, I didn't realize you're talking to me. I don't think it could have been said better than what Dr. Ecker just said. I agree 100% with what he just said. The emphasis I would have to all orthopedic surgeons, as I said in my talk, is don't conceive of the TFCC fourth letter in the word complex as one structure. Yes, the fibers blend, but there are many different functional components to it. Each component has specific functions. And just as Dr. Ecker was pointing out, we need to be sure we understand what the patient has lost through pathology and what we are or are not able to restore for them through our surgical techniques. The other big point I would make to people is to appreciate and understand the difference between repair and reconstruction, where those fall with respect to the state of the existing tissues at the point you get the patient, where you are on the timeline, whether this is an acute response, a chronic response, 
These are important things that have to be kept in mind. I see case reviews when they come to clinic where it's obvious the first surgeon has not thought along these lines. Of course, everyone on this panel thinks along these lines, but for the everyman surgeon out there in the world to emphasize these points. But again, I think Dr. Ecker said it perfectly. Okay. Professor Gabor, you want to say something? No, thank you. Everything is said. You're tired. <laughs> okay. I thank the faculty for uh, being with us for last two and a half, almost three hours here. It was planned to be for two hours, but uh, I just couldn't know to anybody. And uh, I just said yes and yes to yes, because I want to hear more and more and more. And still a lot remains unsaid. As Professor Gebor was saying, because of constraints of time. And I could see that uh, uh, I'm stretching him too long here. Uh, Jeff, it's already 9.30 in uh, Australia now, and I know I'm holding you back from your dinner. But as I said, we want to learn more and probably part two of uh, DRUJ instability is not too far off. And in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to ask the audience to submit questions to me. With your permission, I'll compile the questions in next one week or so. And if you permit, I'll email the questions to you. And if you don't mind, can you can answer those questions to me? Sure. Okay, Excellent. Mark, I'll request you humbly to answer my emails because I know you're awfully busy. And when you don't answer, I feel scared because I literally prepared a PPT on your behalf. I, I was almost sure you're not going to turn up. So I, was I never share. got any emails from you. I only got it from Ravi and Paco. So I think there may be a computer to computer problem because I never did get one from you, but okay. uh, you either send it through Ravi's account or, yes. or otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to send it to Ravi and he's going to forward it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for being with us and uh, telling us that absolutely different way of doing a surgery. And it's going to be, a, it has been a great learning experience. Professor Gabor, out of five times you have been to India, this was the fourth, fifth virtual meeting. This is the second time I'm meeting you here and it has been a great learning experience always. I uh, thank you very much for patiently waiting for all these uh, long hours. I knew it was just too much for you, but I can see from your facial expressions. Uh, thank you very thank much you very here. Much. <laughs> uh, uh, Stephen has, I think, left and uh, Sanjeev Kakar and Paco has already left. So I thank you once again. Uh, Ravi, you want to say something here? And uh, Jeff, you sure. want to say something? Uh, no, except it's been a wonderful experience. It's really nice to be able to mix with the audience and the panel because we're all so tied up with this COVID-19. And I really, the real thing is to keep learning. And uh, we're all wonderful. We're like musicians. We're doctors. And it's an extraordinary experience. Thank you. And it was, yes, a great learning experience. Over to Ravi and uh, Shamshul, please. Yeah, and uh, Vikas and uh, Sudhir. Yeah, we have, we have already extended more than three hours. It's really a great experience. And uh, we are really thankful for the international faculty. Uh, just over to Sudhir, sir, sir, please. Thank you very much. Not with audible, Sudhir, not oh. audible. Not audible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Everything is fine. Thank you. Thank Vikas, you, please. Vikas, sir, please. Vikas, not audible. Some questions which are still left, uh, we we'll keep it for next time. Yeah, because uh, the only thing we could cut short was the question and answer. That was extremely crucial. And unless we had cut short the question and answer, probably we would not have been able to finish and uh, this time because I had a the deadline given by Ravi that if you don't finish, we are going to just uh, switch off everything here. <laughs> no, so no, I tried no. my level best. My one eye is on the, I'm squinting. My one eye is on the, the clock and one eye on all of you here. So I also had a hard time keeping up to the time schedule and the time allotted. Shamshul, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you everybody for a wonderful webinar, sir. Uh, with your permission, I would uh, like to uh, end the live stream, sir. And I understand uh, from Ravi that more than 1,000 people are uh, listening to all of us here. And yeah, this sir, has been recorded. Yeah, uh, with, and it is just not possible to learn everything 100%.
we have to read uh, listen and listen and listen this uh, talk again and again to uh, to gather and uh, incorporate everything in our mind because we had some of the most amazing pictures and uh, complicated problems which were uh, made so easy by all of you here i uh, thank once again and anything else otherwise ravi all yours thank you, thank you sir thank you so much sir thank you ravi can you start sir yeah we can end yeah. dr sanshul we can end now yeah we were around 1500 uh, active online audience sir thank you sir uh, pankaj sir we were having more than 1500 viewers more than 1500 1500 okay i thank uh, everybody uh, 1500 is not thank a sir. small number awesome. thank you awesome. thank you thank you okay all well right. done thanks i take all the next leave. time Jeff, thanks all of you enjoy good. your dinner now <laughs> good, <laughs> good night sir <laughs> see you later everybody yeah. okay